Listen to The Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. I am Scott Philbrook, and I'm pointing the wrong way. Thank you for having me. When I think about medieval torture, it's just like, wow, the quartering seems like one of the worst. We tell each other stories over the fire at the pub. Is that the most uh, haunted place you would say in, in Essex or the most uh, active? Your skin was vibrating with it, and there was dogs barking everywhere all around the village. And then it sort of built to a pitch and then just went vroom. It looked like a, a person, like a human being. It was a person. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm going to say werewolf. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Squarespace, Mint Mobile, Policy Genius, Simply Safe, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. In our last episode, we ventured into the astonishing account of Truman Bathurum and his encounters with beings from another world. Tonight, we dive even deeper into that enigma as we explore the second part of his book, Aboard a Flying Saucer. As we delve into this captivating narrative, it's crucial to remember the era in which it was born. The early days of ufology were not just about little green men and flying saucers. They were intertwined with the occult, secret societies, and not-so-secret groups like Nazis. The 1950s were a hotbed for UFO sightings and contactee stories. But what made Bethurum's tale stand out amidst the sea of extraordinary claims? Was it the bizarre details of his encounters, or the steadfastness with which he defended his experiences? Or was it something more uncanny? Bethurum's story surfaced during the beginnings of Project Blue Book and its predecessor, Project Grudge. Attempts by the government to, at first, categorize and investigate UFO reports that then turned into steadfast efforts to debunk them and control the narrative. But what if these projects were more than just a means to dismiss UFO sightings? Could they have been a veil, hiding a more profound truth, a truth rooted in the realms of the occult? Many UFO sightings of that era were dismissed as misidentified planets or absurd things like swamp gas. But what about the ones that couldn't be explained away? Bathurum's encounters with the saucer people weren't just physical, they were deeply spiritual echoing themes found in occultism. His descriptions of the saucer people's society, their harmony, their lack of conflict, their advanced technology, mirror the utopian ideals often sought in occult practices. So, as we dive deeper into Truman's narrative, remember, the lines between ufology and the occult are not as defined as they might seem. The two were, at this time anyway, entwined, and some say they still are in many ways. Join us as we welcome back special guests Richard Haddam and Rob Christofferson to escort us on our journey further into the mystery that is Truman Bathurum's Aboard a Flying Saucer. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is our editor, Sarah Voorhees Wendell. I expect to be around for thousands of years, but the water in your deserts will mostly be tears. Captain Oro Rains from Truman Bathurum's Aboard a Flying Saucer. Join us tonight for part two of our limited series on Truman Bathurum's 1952 encounters with a UFO. And we're back. That we are. This is it, folks. The spooky season is upon us. Our favorite time of the year. Indeed. Uh, we've got some really fun news tonight before we get started. Uh, for those of you who can't get enough of us in the dark weeks, we just did a crossover appearance on Chris Williamson's podcast, Me and My Friends, and that was a particularly candid conversation. Yeah, sort of behind-the-scenes stuff that you don't usually hear from us. Well, I repeat myself a lot, so I'm sure you have. But uh, no, we were. it's like talking with an old friend, you know? So we opened up. Yeah, we opened up. It was a lot of fun. Chris actually contacted us way back when we first covered Amelia Earhart because he was doing the Chasing Earhart podcast, which is the definitive podcast on Amelia Earhart. And he's the one that invited us to her hometown, Atchison, Kansas, which just so happened to also be the location 
of the Sally House. You know what to do, folks. That <laughs> trip was a double whammy, but our discussion with Chris was wide ranging and fun. So look for me and my friends wherever you get your podcasts and you'll see the episode with us. Also, Forrest was just on yet another episode of History's Greatest Mysteries for like the oh, umpteenth time. Really? And this one is about the Black Dahlia, uh, something oh. we've not covered on Astonishing Legends. Uh, that episode of History's Greatest Mysteries aired on August 7th, so it should be available to stream if you look for it. Did it? It's already out, you say? Yes, it is. August oh, yeah. 7th. Well, we do have a lot of true crime fans, and that case is as notorious and infamous as it is chilling and uh, scary. So check Indeed. it out. And we'd like to take a minute to point folks to our friend Glitter's podcast, Anomaly, out of the UK, A-N-O-M-A-L-Y. And he's recently brought it back after a hiatus. If you like Astonishing Legends, you're going to love Anomaly. And he's got two new episodes up. The latest, as of this moment, is with Dr. Ian Rubenstein, who is both a medical doctor and a medium. And he's working on a new one he's calling Visions of a Post-Apocalyptic Britain. Ooh, that sounds fun. Especially yeah, for dead. me. <laughs> yeah. you, love, <laughs> you love post-apocalyptic stuff, I hear. So Not in reality. In practice, no, no. I, you know, it's fascinating. <laughs> It's fun to imagine, but this is uh, some fascinating stuff. He's a terrific interviewer, so we are waiting with bated breath. So just like Chris's show, Me and My Friends, you can look for Anomaly wherever you find your podcasts, hosted by Paul Gledhill, or as he's known to his friends, Gledders, although I call him Gled because I don't have time for the other syllables. Yes, and I wanted to post one other note here. Whenever we say, wherever you get your podcasts, we mean pretty much every platform. From the Apple Podcasts app, which is automatically loaded onto every iPhone, it's purple, you can't miss it, to iHeartRadio, to Spotify, and all the other ones in between. If it has podcasts, we're on it. Oh, and by the way, our first of three new shows in a row in October isn't until the 14th, so we're going to be releasing some of the older, normally Patreon-exclusive junk drawers into the main feed for fun. So look out for those once October gets rolling. Yeah, there's another important bit of news. This October, as we often do, we'll have three shows in a row, and the first of those three shows is a Listener Stories medley again. One of my favorite anthology times of the year. I just love these stories. I love reading through them. So we'd love for you to send your stories into us, as you have in the past, so we can pick a few out to share on the air. Send us your spookiest stories that you've got. We're, we're going to read everything we get, and short ones can be fun, but we're also looking for some with a little meat on them. If you got some of those, there's a couple of ways to get them to us. One is simply to email them to astonishingcontact at gmail.com, but please, please be sure and put Halloween 2023 in the subject line. So uh, Tess and Forrest and all of us can pick those out. It really makes a difference to put the year in there because we have a ton from last year that say Halloween. Just makes it easier for us to go through them. Halloween 2023 in the subject line. Or you can also call our Google Voice phone number and leave them there as voicemails. The only thing that can get annoying about that is that it has a time limit. So keep that in mind. In the past, people had to call back a few times. But our Google Voice number is 307 800 1382. That's 307-800-1382. And I just want to say something about the types of stories. I know some people uh, have gotten upset and they've written us that they poured their hearts out and we didn't pick them. But as we've also said in the show, we appreciate every one of them and the people opening up to us. That's quite something. It takes a bit it's of very courage. Special. Yeah, it is a very special thing. And it's not that, you know, we thought some stories were better than others in, in the typical ways. It's that the format of the story, some people wrote, I mean, like a couple of pages of a life story of things happening. And like, that is fantastic. It's mind blowing. But we really can't pare that down and still do it justice into the type of anthology shows these are. It would really be its own episode. And maybe one day we will get to something that's a bit like that format. So if you've heard last year's show especially, you'll kind of see the types of stories that we usually go for. Something about a certain length, something that is generally more than just like, I saw this weird shadow. That's interesting too, especially if it happened to you. It's certainly profound. But we're looking for something that has more of a, uh, I guess a little bit of a story arc to it. It doesn't have to be a callback, doesn't have to be a punchline or button to it, but just something that is maybe a little bit more of a head scratcher, something profound, something that has uh, got some real personal oomph to it. That's usually more the stories we try and pick. So again, but don't be discouraged if we don't, because as it may have been mentioned, 
we're thinking of new ways to possibly utilize and showcase these stories later on. Yes, we are. And um, in addition to leaving a voicemail, the other thing you can do that's actually even easier for us is make an audio file like right on your phone with just whatever memo, voice memo app you have and email that file to us once you get it in there. And then you can do it a few times if you're not happy with it. So you can email that again to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. There's a few ways to do this. So send them in sooner than later, folks, because this will be our first show of October on the 14th. So we don't have a lot of time. And now's your chance. Yes, and being that Halloween is almost here, there is a lot of other stuff going on, too. So much we couldn't even wrap our heads around it. So we asked our longtime producer, head of research, social media manager, and general right-hand woman, Tess, to join us tonight and explain some of the other fun stuff happening in the Astonishing Legends universe this spooky 2023 season. Tess, are you there? I'm here, and I'm so excited that this isn't coming out as a list, that you're hearing me. Uh, right in your ears and while you're doing dishes or whatever else you're doing. And like Scott said, it's Halloween season at Astonishing Legends. And we have so much in store this year, probably more than any other year in history. So that's why the guys brought me on to talk about it with you. Let's get into the new and returning legendary Halloween tradition. So this year marks the epic return of our annual Blog Astonishing event. We're inviting you to submit blog topics, and a new blog will be published every single day throughout the month of October. So you won't run out of rabbit holes to investigate this October. Just head to our blog, and if you're an eager beaver to get over there, there's already 500 blogs waiting for you. And how, how do folks submit for that? Uh, you can just either submit on any of the threads we have open on our social media or send an email to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Okay, great. Speaking of epic returns, we have new limited edition Halloween merch. I know I've gotten tons of questions on this from the Facebook group via email. So yes, it's coming back and the AL logo will be redesigned just for the season. But that's not all in merch land. We're stirring up a cauldron full of other thrilling updates to our store that we can't wait to share with you. Any guesses on what the new products will be? Mm exciting. But wait, the Halloween fun doesn't stop there. We're thrilled to kick off the first ever Astonishing Legends Horror Watchathon. Get your popcorn ready, dim the lights, and prepare to delve into our world of spine-chilling cinema curated just for legenders. We sorted our Halloween movie picks into weekly themes and are offering you a curated journey of fright and delight. Each day we have a new scare in store, which will culminate in an end-of-week discussion where we'll dissect our fears and maybe even share a few laughs. Will you be brave enough to join? Like I said, we'll be having weekly live discussions on posts and possibly even live on our Discord. To see the full list of movies, head to any of our social channels or email us at astonishingcontact at gmail.com and I'll send it over to you. Excellent. And just when you thought we had revealed all of our Halloween secrets, there's still more. We have something so huge brewing behind the scenes that I am barely allowed to talk about it. Scott and Forrest might yank me off stage at any moment. But here's a hint. We've only done something like this once before in the entire history of Astonishing Legends. It's scary, it's mysterious, and it echoes through the annals of Astonishing Legends past and future. Any ideas? Well, you'll just have to stick around this Halloween season to find out. Trust us, you don't want to miss this. And that's all for me. Let's just say that this Halloween, Astonishing Legends is delivering equal amounts of scares and surprises. So stay tuned because it's going to be spooktacular. All right, Tess, thanks for the update. That is a lot going on, including things that you weren't supposed to talk about, but you talked about anyway. I lightly talked. I talked around them. <laughs> well, it's uh, she's right, folks. We're going to have some cool merch coming in, and uh, the store is getting overhauled. It's working a, a lot better already. So if you haven't been over there in a minute, check it out. And things that were low on, don't worry, it's being reordered, and things will be restocked soon. And also there will be that new secret special Halloween merch. Tess, thank you for taking time to come and chat with the listeners today. All right. Thanks, y'all. I'll see you in the DMs, emails, and beyond. 
All right, folks, that was a lot of info tonight, uh, but that's what happens in October with us. Uh, We'll have links to all of those shows in the show notes on the webpage for this episode. But as you can see, there's a lot to keep you entertained this year and also super cool new Halloween swag hitting the store soon. Uh, We'll do a special announcement about it, but mark your calendars for October 1st because we will be making that new stuff available for pre-order then, which means you can pre-order it in our store at our website starting on October 1st, probably at midnight or something like that, the night before. And then after a week or two, we'll start printing them up and shipping them out, hopefully in time for everyone to have the, as of now, secret item by Halloween. Well, we've got a great show tonight. Rich and Rob are back to go deep on how Truman Mathurum's bizarre UFO encounters connect to the very origins of modern-day ufology in the United States and even overlaps with the occult. Sarah, would you please roll our roundtable discussion? All right, folks, we are back for round two on a board of Flying Saucer, the Truman Bathurum story. He's a true man, and we, we, we are, we're bringing back our uh, vaunted guests, Mr. Richard Haddam and Rob Christofferson. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Excellent to be back. I feel honored. Greatly honored. <laughs> hey, we're the ones that are honored. You're getting ready to take a little break from your show, I guess, right? Yeah, my, my pod network's holding, and I decided that it was a really good time to take a break and... Um, write a book i don't know it's just yeah. it's weird it's weird how it happens like that i don't know i think that'll be nice it'll be a nice uh hopefully pleasant spiritual journey for you creatively i'm sure it will be rewarding <laughs> and frustrating as hell but we're yeah. gonna make it work <laughs> yeah <laughs> so there's a lot to talk about here there's a lot more to say about truman and his story one thing i did want to lead off with which i told you guys before we went on the air was that the company that he worked for is in fact still in business that construction company i did call them and talk to their receptionist or whoever uh, answers the phones there about 30 minutes ago trying to reach. I called and asked for the CEO whose last name is Wells. So he's like a, a relative of the founder of Wells Cargo. This is not the company that makes trailers. There's another company called Wells Cargo that makes trailers. Those are all over the country. It's completely unrelated. This is Wells Cargo. They do construction work in Nevada mainly and in the Southwest. They build roads and tunnels and that kind of stuff. So anyway, I did call them and I was like, you know, is Mr. Wells there? And she's like, yeah, right. He's not here. What can I help you with? And I'm like, I do a podcast and it's, there's a UFO and a guy from a long time ago. And I'm trying to find this guy. <laughs> did anyone ever work there named Whitey Edwards? And she was just like, uh. Yeah, people love getting phone calls like that on a Monday. <laughs> well, I think you never know. Maybe this, what I wanted to hear was I wanted the, if the guy came on, he might be like, you know what? I know this story. My great grandfather used to talk about it. Whitey did work for our company, but he thought Truman was crazy or whatever. Just like anything like that. You should have employed your considerable skill in ancestry and tried to find two of Bathurum's daughters or granddaughters, which would probably still be alive. You know, it's funny. Mm -hmm. I spent a couple hours in Ancestry on this one, but I spent all of it looking for Waddy Edwards, trying to figure out if he was a real person. And I could not find him. I could not find an E.E. Edwards. I kept finding the same dude over and over, but it was a guy that lived in Arkansas or something. There's no way. I looked for, uh, by the census records, anyone that lived near Mormon Mesa, that lived in Vegas, that lived in that area in the late 40s and early 50s. Nobody. It's hard, though, because all we have is the E.E. That name may have, because he's so involved and still a business person, as we said at the beginning of part one about the references that Truman, True, leaves in his book in the foreword, they seem to be regular real people. He certainly is. That certainly is his real name. He wasn't really shy about that. So I'm saying you may have more luck not trying to find Whitey or E.E. Cumming. So they find the two daughters because Mary was the wife, you know, for the while he was married to during this time. And the two daughters, and here's the thing, is that you may have more luck because of how he described the daughters really embracing dad's wacky stories. And it's like, yeah, that could be it. And they may be more willing to talk. Not that we want to bother people, of course, with this stuff. No, no. But I I mean, I would love to find them. I think the reason that I focused on Edwards was because Mm -hmm. I was trying to find a witness with an additional corroboration outside of the story, because his part of it is mentioned in the book, which we know was ghostwritten by Miss Tennyson or whatever. So it's like, were they just doing that to put a little gravitas onto the story? Like, where is the interview with someone else who saw something? Because Whitey supposedly saw something coming down that's detailed in the book. Mm. And there's quotes attributed to him. So it's like, I want to know if that guy's real. I know Truman's real. And I'm sure his family believes him or supports him in his story, unless he's, 
that's not always an automatic if you have super annoying uncle whatever that lies all the time. But probably, I can see them believing. But what I wanted to hear was like, oh, yeah, no, I was out there that night. Or that guy, my grandfather was out there that night, and he saw something too, that kind of thing. So, But here's an interesting thing I learned today, because I at some point I would looked up Harry S. Truman. Did not know this. The S and Harry S. Truman's name yeah. is not specific to a name. Yes, it's, we all knew that. To- You're the only one who did not know that. <laughs> oh, really? Did Rich know that? Did you know that, Rob? Yeah. Oh, Rob knew, and of course he did. That. Okay, so I not thought, all. It- How about 50-50, Forrest? Let's go 50. No, it's a very, it's a very common, uh, if you get one of those day-to-day trivia calendar tear-offs. I didn't uh, know you, that until yeah, today. That. Yeah, the, you just yeah. put the letter, I guess, in the old days, they would just put the letter and it would refer to multiple mm-hmm. oh, yeah. upstream yeah. relatives. It wasn't necessarily yeah. a full thing. Go. I didn't know that, so... Yep. But Rob informs yeah. me that. So uh, anyway, but Rich, thank you for backing me up on uh, being uninformed. <laughs> I'm with you, Scott. I always Scott. thought it stood for Scott. <laughs> Get it? it Jeez. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot of things to talk about here. This is going to be, I think it's going to be a little bit disjointed, but because there's so many things to touch on. We had talked about uh, towards the end of the last show, the presence of the occult as it relates to uh, right. this particular stage of ufology and, and which is the initial stages of this stuff coming out. So I think that's something we want to get to. Forrest, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just definitely want to really clarify that part two could really stand on its own as an important discussion that Rob is going to elucidate us all on, uh, for the most part. We've certainly done our research on the side here to supporting areas of this discussion, but such a fascinating and I think often overlooked because it it is wacky, it's problematic sometimes, it's uncomfortable, but it's definitely part of the, the mystical lore and the myth, the myth and the legend of ufology in this very critical time, the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s that people are explaining to, but they never really talk about the sociological aspects, the spiritual aspects that came out of this. And there is definitely undeniably a connection to all this. And it's fascinating. And it makes that through line as we did back to the Fox sisters, back to the Watsika wonder. You could uh, draw a line to uh, studies of psi and consciousness. And it is all connected as we often say, but I think a lot of people don't know a lot about this. Certainly we didn't know a whole lot till we started diving into this, but do of their connections. And then when you hear Rob talk about it, it's fascinating. And like I said, it's some parts of it are very troubling, but I think it's stuff that we should know if any of this interests you at all, even if you don't believe in any of this at all. Yeah. Well, what we're going to lead off in all this because 1952 was a watershed year. However, this movement and the, the roots of the underpinnings of these ideas that collided with seeing saucers in the sky and thinking about that and the cultish aspect of it, the connections to the occult start much before that. And so I don't know, Rob, if you want to talk about Swedenborg, and I I say weird pronunciations just to really upset Rich, as I did uh, when I said (laughs) Chaucer, and he got very flustered. And Chaucer. Yes, I just, I I said Chaucer, he's like, it's Chaucer. Excuse me, sir. It's Chaucer. <laughs> I don't know who Forrest has been talking to. He's, well, I was there. Someone out there he's trying to impress. Oh, I see. No, that was on the vertical plane. <laughs> I think the, the vertical plane we were talking about that. Okay, so you got Chaucer, and then how did you say that? How did you say the name? Swedenborg. Swedenborg. Yeah. Yeah, Swedenborg. Borg. Uh, <laughs> Borg. of Borg. If you don't know who Fred Anderson is, uh, he is one of the mm. best ufologists. I call him a ufologist. He probably wouldn't call himself that, but he recently published a book about Swedish high strange cases. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, Ooh. Get their hands on. It's really good. But uh, yeah, so when it comes to the contactees and when you get deep into the literature on it, a lot of people will point to Emanuel Swedenborg as kind of the first contactee um, Mm -hmm. in a sense, because people who made physical contact and people who made psychic contact are kind of put in the same category. There are some people that didn't like that. George Adamski for one of them Mm -hmm. argued with, I think it was George Hunt Williamson. They kind of had a, a falling out over this exact topic, but Swedenborg is an interesting guy because he grew up during the scientific revolution, basically. And he had a great interest in it. He was an engineer by trade. He built industrial machinery and such. And in um, 1744, 
on Easter weekend, he kind of has this um, emotional crisis, as it's called. Um, he falls out of bed and he has this vision of being in Christ's lap. And after that, he comes to believe that he's been divinely commissioned to explain the spiritual meaning of the scripture to everybody. And one of the gifts that is bestowed upon him is the idea that he can see into the spirit world. Hmm. So he basically kind of learns how people exist and live their day-to-day lives in heaven. But one of the concepts that he greatly believed in is the idea of a plurality of worlds. Yeah. At this time, astronomy starting to take off. Mm -hmm. So we've got people putting telescopes up into the sky and, you know, there are a number of planets that have been discovered by Swedenborg's time, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mm -hmm. And he came to believe that he communicated with the spirits of past aliens that had died that hang out around these planets so right. very similar to like like the idea of like astral travel basically yeah is, yeah. Uh, is the way that you put it so he basically went to all these planets he figured out how the inhabitants lived in their day-to-day life and um that became part of the basis of some of his writings he's he wrote endlessly about theology and, and such mm-hmm. like that. But he was such a big influence on a lot of people, including the spiritualist movement, you know, starting in the mid 1800s, especially, you know, the Fox sisters, it starts there and it kind of becomes this big, huge thing. And one of the best examples leading to that is Helene Smith. She was Swiss. She was a Swiss medium. And growing up, she would... When she would write in French, at certain points, she would replace like a a French word with like these really odd characters that didn't make any sense. So as her life goes on and develops, um, she becomes a trans medium. She largely uses automatic writing. She's an automatic painter and such. But what she comes to find is that she communicates with people on Mars Mm -hmm. and comes to find that these are people that have kind of Asian looking features Mm -hmm. and they have cabbage headed dogs. And it's a very strange place. There's actually (laughs) one painting that she produced from this planet and such, but um, there are, I don't think she was the only spiritualist to delve into this medium. Folks, Squarespace has been a great sponsor of Astonishing Legends for a long time now, and we love that because we truly believe that when it comes to building your own website, they are the best game in town. That's why Astonishing Legends is a Squarespace website, and if you've got a great idea bubbling inside of you, waiting to burst into the online world, or even if you're already a seasoned entrepreneur, Squarespace is your go-to platform. You bet it is. It's it's not just your run-of-the-mill website builder. Squarespace is like your all-in-one digital toolbox, ready to give you everything you need to make your mark online. Starting from scratch? No problem. Already have a growing brand that needs some extra oomph? Well, Squarespace has got your back. Absolutely. Let's dive into this thing they've got called the Fluid Engine. Think of it as your own personal web designer that never sleeps. You start with a professionally designed template, and then you can tweak, twist, transform every little detail with this user-friendly drag-and-drop technology. It makes your website look fantastic on desktop and mobile. But what if you're looking to do more than just showcase your brand? What if you want to sell custom merch? Well, Squarespace can help you do that too. Design your products, set your prices, and then let Squarespace handle production, inventory, and shipping so you can sit back, relax, and watch your brand engagement soar. And speaking of selling, their online store features like a dream come true for anyone looking to sell products online. Doesn't matter what you're selling, physical products, digital downloads, or even services. Squarespace gives you all the tools you need to start making money online. It's a one-stop shop for all your e-commerce needs. And let's not forget about their asset library. It's like having your own personal assistant, keeping all of your content organized and accessible from one place. No more losing track of files or scrambling to find that one perfect image. It's all right there at your fingertips. 
Plus, customizing your website is a breeze with Squarespace's flexible templates. You can truly make any website template fit your unique vision. And if you're into video content, Squarespace has you covered with their video collection feature. Showcase your videos in a beautiful, engaging way that keeps your audience coming back for more. You can even set up a paywall to access certain videos. So what are you waiting for, folks? Are you ready to take your online presence to the next level? Are you ready to make your dream website a reality? Then head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. Play around, explore, and, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Use code legends at checkout. Have you heard? Uh, about what? About inflation, it's everywhere. I think it's been mentioned on the news a few times. Uh, yes, I have heard about inflation. It's not great. It's not great. Oh, so you are saying you've heard that inflation is everywhere and it's no good. Yes, ugh, stop it. Wait, wait, what, me or inflation? Uh, preferably both. Copy that, I'll get right on it. And we know one service that can help. So it's time for you to do some math, or maths if you're one of our UK friends. Because speaking about inflation, there's at least one company that's giving us a much needed break, and that's Mint Mobile. So you recently added up just how much Mint Mobile has saved you and your family over the years since you switched? Yeah, I actually switched my whole family to Mint Mobile back in January of 2019. And at that time, my wife and I were paying $230 a month to an unnamed big wireless provider mm. for just two lines. That comes out to over $2,000 a year. It's a lot of money. Money. It's uh, in fact, I think it was twenty seven sixty a year, and we switched. And I now have all three of us, including my son, who at yeah. that time was too young to have a phone. We're all our annual cost is six hundred and forty five dollars for the whole year for all three of us. So if you add up how much I've saved since twenty nineteen, it's just under ten thousand dollars. Wow, that's yeah. a lot of savings. It is a that, lot. Yeah, you're right. And it really adds up fast and can really make a difference if you're trying to save some money for your budget. And how can Mint Mobile do this, you ask? Because they were the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, thus limiting the traditional costs of retail and thereby passing significant savings on to you and us. Yeah, and, and this isn't a cut rate service you're getting for the price. This is premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. Call quality, coverage, and data streaming are excellent, and so are the savings. You can order from home, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same number along with all of your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. Can we stop talking about inflation? Hi, I'm CD, and when I'm not keeping a nervous, curious eye to the skies, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now, let's get back to the show. That idea, if it did originate with Swedenborg... I know everybody is quick to point out, especially nowadays, since we uh, we know so much, we've uh, we've landed probes on Mars, we don't really see anything, at least not, we're not being told about, and on the moon, and and the mm -hmm. idea that there are beings there, and we think of them as flesh and blood. I've always kind right. of thought about this in that idea that there are entities living on these planets or in these realms. It even, I, I connected that to... Middle Earth or an interior Earth or the inner Earth, like the Shaver Mysteries, things like that. I viewed them since I learned of this concept first, second year of college when I took a music ethnicology class. I've mentioned this before, uh, but I really got into, appreciated a lot of the mythology and belief system of the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. And it was explained to me that there is what they call dream time. And I just mm -hmm. love this idea in that it's like an acetate of another reality layered over what we can see and experience with our current senses. And for them, it's very active and very real. And I remember, I think our, my musicologist uh, professor was visiting there, of course, learning the didgeridoo and things like that and all of the, uh, the fun instruments. And the, uh, his guide says, well, you see that near that big tree? That's where, you know, I got the inspiration for this. And he's like, well, there's no tree there. It's just all open kind of rocky desert. It's like, no, no, mate, there's a tree there. He says, I know you can't see it, but in our dream time, there is the dream tree that's there. 
And to them, it's mm-hmm. another layer of physical or accepted reality that's over, like I said, the acetate that you can, you and I cannot see, but you put, you know, if you have the, uh, the vision, you can see these things and it's all kind of agreed upon. And I just thought it was a fascinating concept. Anyway, getting back to your idea of, uh, or Swedenberg's idea that there are other entities, that's how I view them rather than people running around in spacesuits that are insulated because Mercury is so hot. That kind of idea where right. that sounds silly. It's like, okay, well, maybe these are more spiritual type entities or beings. Yeah. And the through line for all of this, a lot of what eventually comes to the contactee movement, it goes through, you know, Swedenborgianism, mesmerism, and uh, we're going to get to theosophy a little bit. And like, I am no expert in theosophy, so I'll say that first and foremost. Like, we're (laughs) going to barely touch the barrel here because if you want to talk about theosophy, that's a series in and of itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's formed in 1875 by Helena Blavatsky, Henry Steele Olcott and about 16 other people. And it's kind of this society that tries to blend science and mysticism and and such because like they didn't like certain things about science. It didn't embrace like the mystery and such. So yeah. Hinduism, Buddhism, Neoplatonism connected the through line through Western esotericism so it's a real mishmash of ideas, which were mm-hmm. at the time very appealing, a little bit like maybe spiritualism at the time. It just, it took off because people were ready for it. Yeah. Like, uh, toward the late 1800s in the States, spiritualism kind of starts to decline. Uh, it takes off in Europe, you know, later on, but at this time it's starting to really decline in popularity. So theosophy comes about and like there are a lot of interesting figures in theosophy one of the ideas is like the idea that there are these masters is what they call them or mahatmas these people who are so enlightened one they live longer lives but they just like have wisdom coming out of their butts like a rainbow or something like that <laughs> so but that's where it comes out a rainbow yeah butt wisdom. exactly it, or a shooting yeah, rainbow, rainbow butt oh, wisdom. okay uh, Mr. Christopherson, oh, God, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I is this going to be on the homework? Uh, <laughs> I just want to sort of see if I'm understanding yeah. what we're saying here. That sort of first wave spiritualism was talking to the dead. This right. sounds like second wave is talking to aliens or disembodied universal entities that hold universal wisdom, almost as a precursor to latter day channeling is that kind of where we are on our sort of calendar that's where we're going to get to with theosophy it starts out very physical so like these mahatmas these masters are physical people um yeah human beings yeah they are basically human beings that you know have just acquired so much wisdom that they can do things like make letters appear in your pockets and stuff like that (laughs) is it through mediumship is it through channeling like what did they say was their method of acquiring this knowledge these masters would just show up and give it to them basically (laughs) so they said that they saw someone they're like okay you the other night i walked out into the forest or onto the mountaintop, or they would wherever. have these random encounters just out in the wild with them. Uh, Helena Blavatsky claimed to have dreams of one named Master Boya for like years, decades from her like childhood until she I met see. him on the street one day. So, like, there's a lot of them. There's Master Moya. There's a guy named Coot Humi. Coot Humi. I read about him a lot. Yeah. There's another interesting figure that will seem familiar to the Astonishing Legends canon. And that is St. Germain himself. Uh, he yes. is still with us. <laughs> See this, but Rob, this Somewhere. connects to uh, is the concept of the Ascended Masters. Yeah. That's basically what we're getting to. Right. Yeah. And so, Rich, if you, what you want to think about this, these aren't space beings. It is somebody that uh, I would say you could be very earthly, maybe 10 people on the planet at any one time. That's another concept that they're the holders yeah. of all the secret knowledge and uh, the uh, esotericism. You have a tradition of the the Greek and Eastern mystical schools, the mystery schools, as mm. they used to call them, where all this accumulated knowledge, and you imagine like you have tens of thousands of monks all meditating and uh, and thinking about the, you know the deep philosophies of Zen Buddhism and yeah. what's beyond that rather than well, we're all very relaxed now. It's an accumulation of human knowledge built right. upon and at some point, it's like the concept of the in the movie her 
which you have a, a, a an AI that at some point when you mass enough knowledge or understanding, you can ascend and be able to travel mm -hmm. beyond this realm. You're You've escaped that in the Ascended Masters. Well, there's a thing called the Great White Brotherhood. And at this point, I would like to point out that yeah. is not anything related to, to the, the, the Lodge no, of White. but it's not a well, great name either. It's a, well, they, yes, it's a little bit of a marketing <laughs> flaw on their part back in the day. But yeah. the idea, though, is it, white as in white light, white enlightenment, the white light of spirit, all that, rather than, uh, let's say, an article of clothing. But the idea is that that, that lodge is somewhere in the uh, Himalayas, uh, Tibet. It's the same kinds of concepts is that there are these masters that have ascended. And there's an old saying with Buddhism or more, more so Hinduism is that when the, uh, when the chela is ready, the guru will come. Meaning when the student is ready, the master will come, the teacher will come. And right. another quote is that in occultism, one must be worthy of enlightenment. So you, when you're talking about cults of personalities here that we're going to get into in, into the 50s and Adamski, not so much Bethurim to, to a point, but George Hunt Williamson, all these people, the Van Tassels, it, it is a little bit of a bit of a cult kind of a thing because these are the people disseminating the knowledge, but it was gained, you know, if you go back to the, the theosophy, then masters have dribbled this knowledge onto the worthy and that's how Ooh. it's attained. So anyway, that's a very long-winded way. This is my style of getting to Rich's point here of, where does the information come? Who are these people dolloping it out? Right. Honey right. dripping the, right. uh, the gems of wisdom. But if we were at a cocktail party with Blavatsky, we would come away thinking, well, if we just sort of hang around outside her house and follow her <laughs> wherever she goes, we'll actually be able to observe her having an interaction somewhere with someone or, or any yeah. of these people, they would simply oh, yeah. say, when you're not, when no one's around, I walk off somewhere and this person comes down and I don't know, maybe it just looks like they're talking to nothing, sort of like the story you told about the tree that isn't there. But these people are saying, we're, we're having sort of a conversation with someone who is manifesting physically to me. Yeah, exactly. And like this happened to a lot of people in the Theosophical Society. There were a lot of people that said, I met, you know, master so-and-so, master. Uh, and it's important to emphasize right now, the term Ascended Masters does not come from Blavatsky. It comes right. from a guy named Charles Ledbetter, who, again, we need to preface that he was a pedophile. I'm sorry, but we just have to preface <laughs> well, that. But he, yeah. he yeah. will take theosophy after Blavatsky's death, and he takes it into this um, area where he kind of takes Swedenborg's ideas and he applies them into theosophy, the idea that they're, you know, the plurality of worlds thing, and that you can astral travel to these places and they have ascended masters there. And that's where these masters become like these, like almost godlike beings in many ways. But after Charles Ledbetter gets in there and really like tinkers and does a lot of unpopular things, there are a lot of sects that start to pop up in theosophy. And one of the most infamous is a sect called the I Am Cult. And the I Am Cult, it was run by uh, Guy and Edna Ballard. I think Guy Ballard was inspired by a book called A Dweller on Two Planets. And this is a book, it was allegedly channeled by a 17-year-old kid named Frederick Oliver. And when you think of Mount Shasta being this mystical place mm -hmm. it's because of this book and when you think of mount shasta as this area where white people just trample all over the place with their new age crap mm -hmm. i'm not gonna sugarcoat it here like one of the things that you, i think people need to understand about mount shasta it has a very delicate ecosystem that gets trampled by people that do not need to be there that's just my opinion but it's through a dweller on two planets that you really get this um, idea of Mount Shasta being this ultimate holy place. And it, and it is to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So that goes on to influence Guy Ballard so much that he ends up going around Mount Shasta in the 1930s. And do you know who he runs into there? 
You want to know who? St. Germain <laughs> in the flesh. That's he just right. Runs into oh, I was say, yes. I was gonna, that's where we first nice. mentioned it, Scott. It was so many years ago. We All this knowledge has flown out of our yeah. heads. Uh, but that was where yeah. we first started uh, poking around with this because they make a connection to him. Anybody who's purportedly seems to have uh, conquered death and dying and, and going into the other realms or has managed to figure out how to not die and make a fabulous hair tint that is somebody that you can kind of connect with and ride the coattails a little bit on the mysticism part yeah. and, and the mythology. And that's where we had, I think we're still doing it today and you see people do it maybe for fun and they still believe it, but there's a lot of talk now about St. Germain's son having survived, you know, he, he survived, he lived in mm-hmm. New Orleans and he's in the French quarter and he's throwing blood parties where you can drink the blood and live forever, blah, 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 a lot of rich people. And it's like, I don't yeah. ever recall in any of our readings that he ever sired any kids, but now people have tacked on to that. It's like, well, no, it's like a vampire cult. It's like, okay, that's mm-hmm. fun, but there's, it's, he's a real historical person. He's a real figure that there is no evidence of that. So uh, again, that's that's right. this myth building I see a little bit going on here. And then you have somebody right. attaching that to, it's not the French Quarter, it's Mount Shasta or it's Mount Rainier. But any mount is mystical. Things fly out yeah. of it. Dulce Bays, right. there's, there's the, you know, any kind of, it, it always has been. You point to that as humans and it's like a Devil's Tower. That looks kind of strange and odd and ominous and there's a vibe there and ancient peoples did it and we're going to take that and set up a gift shop now at the base of it. Basically, yeah, like uh, people who don't understand geology, just like, wow, that's cool. How do we exploit that and uh, turn it into some really strange and weird ideas? Yeah, Guy Ballard, he basically, you know, talks about journeying with St. Germain, learning about uh, there's like a like a group of people that live in. I can't remember if they're Lemurians or not, Mm. but like one of the things that. a lot of people should understand is that Atlanteans and Lemurians, a lot of that comes from Blavatsky herself. Like those Mm -hmm. ideas were old, but she like took those and populated them into these really more drawn out myths. So like Lemurians and Atlanteans are part of uh, it's called the root race theory. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into the root race theory because it's very complicated, but that is where it's through other people that um, formed other sects of theosophy called Ariosophy, which is where Hitler basically got his ideas about the Aryan race and such like that. You can trace it back to the root race stuff. People took it and they turned it into some really bad anti-Semitic crap. Who are the Lemurians and who are the Atlanteans? So there was a theory back in the 1800s and it was popularized by a zoologist named Philip Sclatter. And he believed that because lemurs were found in India and I forget exactly Madagascar. Madagascar? But, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think. There had to have been a <laughs> well, land. If you've seen the movie, I think. I've never know. seen that. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen the movie, but uh, <laughs> it's just anything anything strange and That's unusual a as, it, as a big chunk that had broken off from uh, the African continent. It's Madagascar has a, a unique, in many ways, uh, biosphere, I think. That there's a- animals and creatures. They want to yeah. move it, move it. They want to move it, move <laughs> exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Rich, exactly. Rich, Rich, did you just get $4 yeah. worth of a uh, residual on that for having some connection to the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah. But, like, that's basically the idea is this guy thought there was a land bridge. It's really dumb. But, like, Blavatsky takes it and connects that land bridge all the way to Australia uh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, for okay. some reason. By this time, I don't think Atlantis was this big, huge... Like, oh, Atlantis was a this continent, this lost yeah. continent or anything like that. I think she helped to popularize the idea that it that it was because it is part of the root race theory, which is a v- pretty vital part of her book, The Secret Doctrine. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not going to get into it because it's it's complicated. Yeah, and, it is all very complicated. Yes. Yeah, I guarantee I'll get it wrong. But <laughs> so like going back to the I am cult, the I am cult rises to prom i wouldn't say like yeah it gets to be uh gets a certain level of popularity Mm -hmm. uh throughout the 1930s it is a right-wing christian nationalist 
religion in which they actually promoted overthrowing the government. And they were really big with a guy named William Dudley Pelly. And William Dudley Pelly, for lack of a better term, I mean, he was uh, he was a writer. He was a screenwriter. Uh, he was also like, all right, take it easy. Yeah. Take it easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Take it easy. I will. But he was a Nazi and he formed uh, this party, the Silver Legion of America, better mm-hmm. called, better known as the Silver Shirts. They and wore silver shirts, which I found impressive mm-hmm. for, for back then. a giant L yeah. on them. Yeah. It's, it's basically a silver shirt with a giant L to kind of emulate Hitler and mm-hmm. what he was wearing. And. The members of the Silver Shirts actually became part of the I Am Cult. And the I Am Cult goes on to influence every, just about every New Age movement that you can think of. Most specifically and directly, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, who is mm, mm. You know, problematic in her own right. But eventually, Dudley Pelly, he goes to jail for, I think it's sedition for about seven years. Uh, he serves seven years out of a 15-year sentence. He gets out in 1949 and he starts to develop this idea of like soul craft uh, it's his ufo theory the main reason that he got into like occult beliefs and such is because he had um essentially a near-death experience in 1928 and that like severely messes with his mind i don't want to get too far down the dudley pelly rabbit hole but we'll you know touch on a little bit more but uh if you want to pretty good episode about him check out the saucer life they did uh, mm-hmm. aaron did a really great episode about kind of like the more mystical side of things but he goes on to strike up a friendship with a guy named george hunt williamson and williamson is one of the witnesses that was there the day that george adomsky had his first contact with orthon he was a witness to it but he was out in the desert you know, they were all looking for UFOs that day. But on that day, it was in November of 1952 that that he had his contact. George Hunt Williamson was there. They had struck up a friendship. And Williamson uh, was also really chummy with William Dudley Pelly to the point where his beliefs started to... You could start to see... Pelly's beliefs in Dudley's or, or in Williamson's writing, like later on down the line. Yeah. Uh, Williamson was, he was more of, more of a psychic contactee, but he came forward with his own contacts. And this is all at the same time that uh, Truman Bethram's going down with his stuff. So if you want to trace the line, Truman has his contacts in June, late June of, uh, 52 in august of 52 williamson starts messing around with ouija boards and starts claiming Mm -hmm. to have contact and then you have george adomsky the thing is it's like george adomsky is the first person to put it publish it but they're all in the same time period yeah so rob what are we suggesting are are we suggesting that george adomsky and truman bethurum and uh george hunt williamson that these guys knew all this stuff and were consciously continuing it for their own gain or aims or is it more like they were all being pushed along on this weird wave of occult zeitgeist something you know adomsky had his own occult beliefs you know he had um what the order of tibet his group that he formed um before he became a contactee and like Tibet's Shangri-La, basically, for anybody who has uh, is into like Eastern mysticism and stuff like that. You know, getting into Tibet is extremely hard, and white people don't go there for Helena Blavatsky. But like a lot of this was in influencing these groups. Um, when it comes to Adamski, Desmond Leslie was a Theosophist. And he co-wrote uh, right. Flying Saucers Have Landed. So mm-hmm. if you now, read Flying Saucers Have Landed, there's a lot of theosophy in it. Just to take Truman, though, he doesn't mention Adamski until the end of his book, which, which suggests mm-hmm. his first interactions with Adamski came later. Right. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I just are, are we suggesting that maybe that's not the case and that he knew about Adamski and knew what he was up to 
and philosophically agreed with it and created his own story to match up to it? I, I don't know. Do, do you have an opinion or a thought on that? Well, I mean, Adamski, some of Adamski's story was out there beforehand. Uh, he had published in Fate, I think, in 51. So I, I, while I it's don't possible. think... Yeah, while I don't think Adamski was a household name, I think uh, if you knew the literature that uh, his name was starting to get out there more and more. You brought up a good point. It's like, why are all these guys in Southern California mm. right around the same time? Mm. Is it coincidence or were they all tied in? Like, have we found the, you know, deep throat? Is it Desmond Leslie? I mean, do you think there was someone who was kind of seeding the water so that suddenly all these people are, hey, I had the same revelation you did a few months ago. And like, I think a lot of them fed off of the, uh, each other. And I don't think you can like not look at that and see that, oh, well, this guy's doing this. So like, I, like the fact that these are all popping up at the same time is interesting, but I think... You're saying they should not each be looked at in a vacuum. Right. Exactly. Got it. What we're seeing, there's a bit of that. It's led by personality. I think it's a giant spiritual metaphysical bouillabaisse of personality mixed with a zeitgeist movement and that it's a little bit like simultaneous discovery and that people are coming up with these concepts. They're mm -hmm. popular. It One fuels the other. Next thing you know, something Rob pointed out is that you have this massive migration. What is it about California during this time, right. early 50s into the 60s? And then uh, you would see that kind of played out. Speaking of film in uh, one of my favorite films, uh, Harper, which was uh, written by legendary screenwriter William Golden adapted from a uh, Ross McDonald 1949 novel, uh, The Moving Target, that stars Paul Newman as the character. But he has to deal with a lot of these freaky 60s cults, man, and this weird hippie stuff tied in mm -hmm. with a lot of bunch of weird people and wow. murder, Manson, it boils over. But you have this groundswell. I think that is that is maybe a bit psychic, zeitgeist, whatever the uh, the collective consciousness mm -hmm. aspect is peppered and fueled by these dynamic personalities that people can latch on to because people are looking right. for these personalities and then you, then they're here they are. And speaking of which that, yeah, I have a note here and this is again from the, uh, one of the other lectures uh, from Professor Richard B. Spence on uh, the real history of secret societies, uh, lecture number 26, and he was just made a mention here that there's another piece of physical evidence that I, I mentioned because it ties in with our Van Meter uh, episode. Uh, it was at November 20th. There's a small group of people and they meet outside a canyon location in uh, Desert Center, California. Road trip. What do you say, Rich? Desert. <laughs> and they all go out there to photograph these craft that Adamski, who now is calling himself the professor, says that he witnesses and he's, gonna, he's going to photograph them. But it turns out only he can really see them. But among that group is George Hunt Williamson, who's 25 at the time. And, and he's uh, he's a military veteran at this point, ex-military man, considers himself an amateur archaeologist. They set up a telescope and they wait. And it was only Adamski who had then, uh, or after that, had claimed to see various spacecraft and meets the Venusian Orthon. But apparently, Williamson took plaster casts from the footprints of Orthon, mm -hmm. and on the bottom of them, they had these cryptic symbols. Somewhere those are there are those plaster casts. So again, it's like the right. where's, where's the uh, Van Meter monster plaster cast? Where are all these mystical plaster casts floating around in people's uh, attics? They're lost, you know, in the <laughs> National Archives where everything gets lost. They're it's in that, it's just how it happens. That's how it happens. And Pope's got them in the basement there in the you, Vatican. There you go. Yeah. But yes, no, there's definitely, I think, a through line through history, whatever, that culminates in Southern California and Sh Mount Shasta, uh, central to Northern California. Is that It's just a ripe time. Right. It just, it was a movement. And I think that's part of it. And then we still see the evidence of that into, into the 80s. And uh, maybe a little bit now. And, and I remember when I was growing up, not having ever visited the state as a kid, but I just remember that was the reputation. It's just flakes and nuts and kind of weird people and Mahatmas mm -hmm. and, and uh, moo moos and caftans and whatever. Yeah. So like what I'm, what I'm getting at is the Space Brothers are your next evolution of master, whether you want to call them ascended masters or what. And you can see that specifically in 
contactees like George King, who was very Christian influenced. He talked about Jesus as being a master and a theorist who was the uh, main alien that he made contact with is essentially a master. Orthon is basically a master. All of these people are these like wise and great people that are here dispensing wisdom and, and all of this stuff. So it, it seems like the next stage in evolution, you know, going all the way back to Swedenborg, all the way through theosophy until now, like everything's influencing everything else. So that's basically where I wanted to take it. I think that's where I ended up in my head. But like, mm -hmm. there are a lot of philosophical influences in the contactees. There's also, and, and you kind of got to pay attention to it when you see it with certain groups, especially with like George Hunt Williamson. There is Nazi stuff in there. Just, you know, keep an eye yeah. out for it when you see it. But yeah, this is uh, basically the next stage in evolution from theosophy and the quote unquote masters. So mm. that's where it shares a lot of its occult roots. And I think what's interesting about Truman Bethram is like, he doesn't have all this knowledge. He doesn't have all of this. Right. So like his wise person is not some, you know, six foot tall white dude with blonde <laughs> hair. It's right. a short woman with black hair. And like, yeah, she's human looking, but like there's subtle differences, mm -hmm. you know, between Truman Bathroom and a lot of the other, a lot of the other contactees, but uh, also like, um, I think the greatest influence is through like the channelers. Like yeah. that's where you see a lot of the theosophy come through, uh, you know, people just channeling uh, whatever kind of philosophy that they want to into their beliefs. I'm happy to say we have one sponsor that's back with us after a few years because they really helped me and my folks out when we needed it. And that's policy genius. My parents wanted to know what kind of life insurance policies were available to them and asked me to help them research some options. But as you might guess, that can get kind of tricky when you're a senior citizen and pretty expensive. I also didn't totally trust the websites I was finding online, nor all the ads you see running on channels that air old TV shows. But I just call it Policy Genius, and the patient and super helpful agent talked me through all the options, explained how the policies worked and the total costs, and gave us some great leads. And then he followed up a few days later to make sure we were satisfied and taken care of, but without annoying us. So we were really pleased with the experience. Man, that's great. You can't put a price on the peace of mind you get from a good life insurance plan, knowing that your family will have a safety net to cover mortgage payments, college costs, or, or just day-to-day -day expenses should something happen to you. It might be tough to think about, but they'll need to get back on their feet to be able to focus on what's most important. And Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is. That's why their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed, award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Policy Genius is for parents, caregivers, and anyone else who has people who depend on them. They simplify the process of getting life insurance so you can protect the people you love. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. What's the weather there like? Is it finally starting to cool off and not feel like a sauna? I got to tell you, man, it has been gorgeous here in North Carolina Ooh. the past few days. Uh, it, but you know what really feels like the fall is that we're all back to our routines. The kids back in school. I'm actually a soccer dad now. Wow. <laughs> going to games and picking <laughs> up from practices and all that stuff. Plus, we're running around outside more now that there isn't 95% humidity. But, but that also means <laughs> we're yeah. away from the house a lot more or down at the beach while it's still nice. And the, and the last thing we want to worry about is the house being empty and vulnerable. Oh, I know. And that's why we recommend Simply Safe Home Security and their revolutionary home monitoring innovation 24 7 Live Guard Protection. It's designed to help stop crime in real time. 
Now, if an intruder breaks into your home, simply say professional monitoring agents can actually see, speak to, and deter them through Simply Safe's new smart alarm wireless indoor camera. 24 7 live guard protection is made possible by the new smart alarm wireless indoor camera available with a fast protect monitoring plan it's pretty amazing because it's the next best thing to be in there myself and with simply safe watching our backs i won't have to get all john wick on any intruders uh uh-huh. i don't really see that happening but thank goodness because the new smart alarm indoor camera is the only indoor security camera that can trigger the alarm and instantly deter intruders with a built-in siren. And being a privacy enthusiast, I love that it has a physical privacy shutter to provide protection when you need it and privacy when you want it. 24-7 Live Guard protection and the new Smart Alarm indoor camera work seamlessly as part of the Simply Safe system to keep your whole home safe from break-ins, fires, floods, and more. And speaking of cooler weather and flood protection, you remember our mutual friend who had some pipes freeze and burst and it devastated his home remodeling project? Oh, yeah. yeah. What was that story again? And I'll tell you next time. But suffice it to say, I'm sure he would have given anything to have 24-7 live guard protection save his walls and floors. Well, Simply Safe wasn't around then, but they are now. So get that peace of mind. And you can get it how you want it. Install it your way, where you can do it yourself in about 30 minutes, which I prefer, or have a Simply Safe expert set it up for you. Either way, it's easy to protect your home. Whatever your preference, get that protection before something happens. For a limited time, get 20% off your new system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Visit simplysafe.com slash AL. That's simplysafe.com slash AL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. I'm Jesse Hall, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Where do you come down on that? Like, you have so much knowledge about this area in this field and the, you know, the history of ufology and this particular moment in Mm. it. What is your personal take on the reality of these experiences and all these characters involved at this stage in it? So I think what's interesting, especially about 1952, and again, when you put it into the context of everything that's going on, there's just a lot of UFO stuff. You've got 1,500 documented sightings from Project Blue Book. They received 1,500 reports. And again, 1952 accounts for the highest number of unidentified cases, which is 303. Again, that's 43% of the entire sum total of unexplained cases throughout the 20-plus uh, year history of the government UFO studies from 1947 1948, all the way up until 1969. Right. So 20 years, almost 50% of the yeah. of the 20 years of the things they couldn't explain mm-hmm. happened in 52. Like 52 is a smorgasbord. And yeah. when you think about it, yeah, Donald Kehoe has promoted the idea of extraterrestrials, but... Nobody's really seen extraterrestrials. Nobody's really talking about extraterrestrials. And then until a group of people come forward claiming extraterrestrial contact. And it's not just the the contactees. You got to think about the Flatwoods Monster case, Mm. which was pretty big around this time. Blue Book investigated it to the sense that they investigated whatever fell out of the sky. They didn't care about the uh, encounter that the maze uh, had. There is the story of Sonny Divergers, who it's tough to say whether he saw an alien or not. Mm -hmm. He for sure got zapped by something. Whether, you know, it was a UFO lightning strike, I don't know. But like... Is that the Scoutmaster in the Everglades? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. right. So I I just listened to your episode on this today is the only reason I know what's going on here. But there's episode uh, uh, 139 of Our Strange Skies, I believe which is outstanding if folks want to drill down on 1952 a lot more, that you're just not going to get a better coverage of it than that episode. But yeah, so the Scoutmaster, he was like, I saw something, and he goes off into the Everglades, mm-hmm. and then they can't find him. Yeah. And then he comes back out, and he's burnt to a crisp with his machete, and he's gone a little bit mad. Yes. And he's, yeah. And and you said on your episode on 139 that they did find that the grass was singed, but beneath the soil it was singed yes. where he was saying something happened, but not on top. Yes. Yeah. And the interesting thing there is, is like, 
Edward Ruppelt called him the greatest hoaxer of all time, but like you can't hoax that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that doesn't yeah. right. that doesn't make you any sense. Can't burn grass underground. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So whatever <laughs> right, happened right. was unique. Yeah, you, that can't be overlooked. It's uh, and and a lot of it comes back down to the fact that Sunny Divergers was kind of a he told a few tall tales in his life, kind of seen as a little bit of a crazy guy if you want to put it that way but uh well and like a lot of this and you find this in every single kind of paranormal phenomenon you find it with mediums that just because there's some faking doesn't mean it's all fake right yeah we've always said often the faking comes a little later when the original story has lost its its luster and people are like well there was no proof and now people are like well now i'm going to manufacture false evidence to bolster a new claim to give further reach to the old first legitimate claim. Yes, yeah. I have this exact same observation, Rich. I wish there was a name for it, but like, because we've talked about that on our own show, where it's like, it's like with um and uh, what was his name for us from Delphus Ring? Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, Johnson. Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie. Johnson, yeah, but, yeah. Ronnie's like first thing I think was real, and then maybe he got upset. People weren't believing him, and the stuff that came after was maybe not as real. But it's just like, please believe me. We've encountered that dozens of times. I think you have to well, be careful. I would say just quickly though, I do not yeah. label every. Everybody with that. I think we have a tendency to. Nobody said no, no, but that's a, it's a common <laughs> thing. It's like that we, we've both mentioned you yeah. and I. It's just like, well, the stuff afterwards yeah. it was a little wacky. We think maybe he was trying too hard to get people to believe. We don't. No, that's a speculation and a dispersion, possibly on the person's character. But we've always seen this. I call it the the boy who cried wolf. We mentioned this in Missing 411. Is that yes, the first two times were were bad pranks. The third time, there really was a wolf. Right. At right. that point, it wasn't, uh, there was a real wolf, and then he tried to make up two other wolf encounters, and then nobody, oh, there you go, he, we didn't really see a wolf the first time, these other two are crazy. Wow, maybe, who knows, maybe the people who are crying wolf are manifesting the wolf, and then the wolf really well, comes. Right. Right. Uh, um, who, so maybe it starts out as who, exaggeration, and now you I don't think that sounds it. as wacky as you, it's, you're, it's your own personal you're intending, culpa, is, song, as the, we're heading towards yeah. formulating ideas here, is that I've, this made me think a lot more about the experience and the general sense of the phenomena is that it's it's not and, and there's all these mythological joseph campbell type kind of things that are happening with with the human psyche and spirituality and and the, the through line and the soul and if you believe grays just think we're a collective of energy the you know, out of entropy in the universe blah 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 there are these things that keep popping up and it's so fascinating to me is that you have ideas that we were talking earlier about uh, the flatwoods monster also wearing a fashionable skirt along with Aura Reigns, Captain Aura Reigns, both having fashionable skirts. If I had the chance, I wouldn't have run away. I would have asked the Flatwoods monster out on a date. Exactly. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> well, I would have done it. That's what I'm saying. A very smart, <laughs> and that, I'm not being silly. That's a, it's right. a very unusual way to describe an outfit with an alien that has, right. Rich was talking earlier before we started rolling here, about the halo, the angelic aspect of everything mm. that we've seen in, uh, since... Uh, paintings from the middle ages and beyond this one happens to be onion shaped or something just that kind of that weird heart upside down heart shape of but a, a glowing light back to the van meter monster some kind of creature with a light coming out of its head something shining lights very important Ooh. here the aura the great white light whatever that is that's one of the through lines well and now you've got a person literally named aura yes exactly right. yeah exactly yeah yeah. And and so these things, it's, it's like, is that just, again, in our imagination, collective consciousness, where we just think of the same tropes and our fairy tales from our earliest times of recorded history just happen to be the same? And we're using, the, you know, what was it Shakespeare's, Rich would know, there's 18 to 21 different, uh, all, this, all the set plot points, the, all the same stories evolve from the same 18 sets of the same exact story, you know, outlines. Or is there more to it? Is, if you've got that, could you would you mind actually sending? That I think to that's me an now? app. You can get that. I'll Use show you that. where to get that on your phone. Where it just cranks, <laughs> it spits out a screenplay for three ninety nine, uh, which is where yeah. things are headed. It's called Chat GPT. Chat GPT. <laughs> it's it's not good. It's just you, but you got something. No, that you can not. turn in. But the overall point here I'm seeing is that to Scott's comical point of like maybe you're just thinking about it, it's creating it. I do think it's being tailored to the individual. I do that there's something right. there. It's like in all these aspects, I, this another thing yeah. in rereading the last part of the book, something that Scott also said, uh, where we were mentioning this as well, that happens in the 
Mothman prophecies is that it's always just one more phone call. Like, we're going to pick you up on the 12th visit. True. So get yeah. dressed. And then you have 11 visits. It's just always out of reach. It's always that promise that never happens. It's this, what well, we're going to have disclosure. Uh, we're all going to take rides to Clarion. Not this year. Even though they promise, the, they promise you that. I would make the argument that Truman Bathurum is like the minority in this case because yeah. almost every other contactee published a book after that saying, right, right. I went to Venus, I went to Mars, yeah, I went yeah. to all of these other places. And I mean, Clarion comes up again later. Uh, there's a woman, I believe her name was Dorothy Martin, who later claimed to channel messages from Clarion. So like there's that added element. Um, and there's one thing I wanted to add to the uh, the idea that Maybe some people do like fabricate evidence of something that really happened. Are you all familiar with the Ronnie Hill photo from 1967? Oh, it's a yeah. photo that looks like a baseball that's supposed to be a UFO and a Barbie doll. It's vaguely familiar. Yeah. I, I did a, a thread on it on Twitter. I'll send that to you um, in the chat here, but like, you, you'll I recognize the photo. I see it. Yeah. yeah, you'll recognize the photo when you see it. Here's the thing about Ronnie Hill. Like, I think that photo's BS. I don't think it's real. I think what happened is Ronnie experienced something and he tried to recreate it the best he could because Ronnie was an upstanding kid. He was yeah. part of the 4-H club. He was uh, a leader and a scout leader for his group. All around bright kid, got straight A's and stuff like that. But here along comes this UFO and... I think it was John Keel that investigated the case. He wrote about it for Flying Saucer Review. And uh, he's like, no, nah, this kid's making it up. And uh, that's the thing about Keel, though, that mm -hmm. uh, I don't I, I, I don't always agree with him. Everything's just like either a hoax or like if it affects him, it's real. So, right. like, you know, the silent contact <laughs> yeah, stuff yeah. is real. But like, again, that also gets to the point, like when you talk about the Mothman prophecies, especially the book, he puts himself into the book that's the first right. thing he literally does so i i don't think ronnie hill was hoaxing anything mm -hmm. other than taking a bunk photo but again i'm one of those people who does not believe that uh photos and videos provide the best evidence for ufos i i mean like the Sri mountain video is absolutely yeah. compelling it's very yeah. interesting i don't really know what those are the only problem is, is like uh, if you listen to Delbert Newhouse talk yeah. about what these objects were, you can't make that out in the video. There is an infamous in Sweden case, uh, this guy, Ake Leon, I think was his uh -huh. name. I, I totally butchered the name. But when he was a teenager, I forget uh, who he was visiting, but over this one lake, he saw a UFO, a disc-shaped object, and he saw a triangular shaped object emerge from this and just kind of fly and re-enter it. And he was able to take photographs of the triangle. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, they're really compelling photographs. Again, it doesn't totally act as right. proof. But at this time, we're talking about George Adomsky, the man who claims to have gotten photographic evidence of, of what he had seen. But it's just like... Uh, it's interesting to see like the juxtaposition of someone who you firmly believe has witnessed something and is fabricating evidence as opposed to, do we put a Domsky in that category? Did he witness yeah, something right. and then they up a bunch of, you know, UFO photographs, uh, you know, in order to bolster his account? There are a couple of others. The other one I, I don't want to mention, because a lot of people, again, you can find this fun and some people like to follow uh, these there's another character who I believe is still alive and does have a compound with followers and puts out a newsletter mm -hmm. and he's uh, I, I, I don't want to speak ill of it because again we've got a lot of letters like people are like, you got to check this guy out he's terrific and it's like eh, he kind of strikes me as somebody along the lines of this cult of personality aspect of it but that's why I do love Truman and his story where I'm not sure if all of that that he experienced is concrete in the way that he describes it. Because again, going back to the point where it is the elusive vision that keeps leading you along, 
He gets Whitey there. That's what I'm saying. It's like you talk to Whitey, even if Whitey was, Whitey's 110, but you can still talk to him. It's like, well, I came out of that diner and there was nothing there. What am I, what do you want me to say? It's his good friend. And, you know, as he said, uh, you know, kind smiles, twinkling eyes when he's telling his story, but nobody really wants to go out to the desert with him because it's a waste of time. Also, what if you do see something? It's scary. So nobody's interested in that. And, you know, in the diner that comes out, here's the other thing that's interesting. If he's telling it like it really happened, Truman, then the waitress saw the woman at the counter and talked to her, relayed a message. Mm -hmm. But they come out of the door and who's the person that he needs to have believe him? Whitey? Doesn't see it. Sorry, True. Didn't see a soul come out. Right. It's just always elusive. But I want to say there are different levels of this. And I just want to quickly say, because I think this is something interesting, I made a note of Rob saying in our thread, the Delbert Newhouse, Tremonton, Utah footage from, nineteen again, 1952, uh, taken over Tremonton, Utah with a 16 millimeter camera by, again, this is just, this is a classic example. And I, I only, I was recognized the name, of course, because Delbert Newhouse is kind of, is a little unusual as my own name is, but you tend to recognize it. I knew there was a film that's pretty compelling, but if you had somebody, you could say like, well, why doesn't ever anybody ever get any good footage, man? It's like, well, here's a guy who is the official naval photographer for his unit, and he's got a 16 millimeter camera, and he's on a road trip with his family, and it's like the perfect time. It's daylight, but as you said, as folks know, you've ever taken a shot of a beautiful, gorgeous sunset that's just blown you away, and you'd get your eye, even if your latest generation smartphone, and you look at it, like, yeah, it's pretty, but it doesn't really capture it. It doesn't really got, which, because there's an emotional aspect of that, and also the lacking of the image capturing technology, whether it's film or whatever. He had it on the wrong setting. Imagine being in that case where you are the uh, the naval photographer who does have this, but you're so excited that you try at a different f-stop and that's where he says, well, it looked better, but I made the mistake thinking that uh, these might be in better focus if I stop the aperture down and try to get more depth of field. And it didn't really work. But I just want to make this clear because what we're seeing is a transfer that was later embedded into a documentary and what we found is a cut down of that documentary, but it does have some graphics at the end of it. So I just want to say here, because I believe Rob had said that this was totally debunked as balloons by Project Blue Book. It wasn't Blue Book. It was the Robertson panel. That the came Robertson in and panel. Said it was birds. Okay. Now I made yeah. these notes. I transcribed them directly from the, the Chiron scroll or the, uh, the rolling graphics at the end of the interview with Delbert Newhouse and a military uh, officer here. Uh, he said, yeah, he got his Bell & Hell 16mm film camera out, first shooting at F8, and then thinking to get the sky in better exposure, he switched to, uh, this is, I got a turret lens, I believe, F16 using a 3-inch lens, but the objects moved further away, and it just didn't come out that well, but you can still see them. Now, this film, it, he said, look, basically it's classic saucer shape. One saucer on top of another, they appear to be constructed with a shiny metal, that's similar to what uh, Truman was describing his as. And the scroll and conclusion graphic at the end, these are the conclusive statements at the end of this official military documentary. There are some points, and it says uh, they are, and again, this is cut down, so I didn't see them all, and I did not try to search for the original, but uh, these are the important points. They are definitely not free-falling. They are not meteors, birds, or any mm. kind of known aircraft. The Utah film, 7 to 16 objects being seen, was studied by the Photo Reconnaissance Laboratory, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and by the U.S. Navy Photo Interpretation Center, Washington, D.C. Okay, that's what you want to study this film. The conclusions was one, the objects appear to be a light source rather than reflected light. That's interesting. They are emitting light, not reflecting it. Two, all the objects appear to be the same size and circular in shape. Three, the general color of the objects seem to be bluish white. If the distance is assumed to be five miles and the movement perpendicular to the line of sight, the average velocity is noted at uh, 653 miles per hour. The speed of sound is 767 miles per hour. Generally, the movement appears to follow an elliptical pattern or circular pattern that we see we see a lot. Here's the important part is that uh, while the objects remain unidentified, the following possibilities have been eliminated. One, balloons. Two, aircraft. Three, birds. So basically, with microscopic examination, the objects are, they're well-focused in that film that they're seeing, not the one that we are, which is the transfer. Their size varies from one sixteenth to one tenth, the moon of the moon's size as it appears to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of comparison to the Montana film. I'm not sure that was taken two years earlier, two years and hundreds of miles apart. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. They were these were two. Uh, it was also another film that was presented to the Robertson panel, which right. they were not. Um, well, this is this is my point, Rob, is that here you have the Robertson panel. It's like, yeah, it's birds. Yeah, actually, I have a quote that I'd like to read. This is from yeah. J. Allen Hynek, who was, you know, there watching on the panel. He was giving uh, his own testimony. And uh, this is what he said about the Robertson panel looking at the videos. Quote, the viewing of the two films is the incident which remains by far the most vivid in my mind, the rather informal attitude at the time. The men had left their austere positions around the conference table and were sort of crouching around and leaning over each other's shoulders watching the films. There was a whole interplay of comments. Not exactly wisecracks, but, well, it certainly looks like seagulls to me. And you can't convince <laughs> me that that's not birds. It's got to be birds. And mm. words to that effect. Some people expressed a little dismay at the Tremont and films, and they didn't realize that birds could reflect that much. And someone would say, oh, yes, if the light's right, sun's right. And I believe I mentioned that the change in light was too rapid for it to be birds in flight. But that got nowhere. End quote. So yeah. it's birds. I, t I told you it's mm -hmm. birds. No, shut up. It's that kind of it yeah. is that the hubris. It's like, let's move on. Uh, you know what? Lunch. They're serving lunch downstairs. Let's get on with this. There's no methodology to what they're doing. It's and you guys said this on episode 139. You're like, it sounds like a, you know, a bunch of frat boys standing around having beers, just like speculating, wildly speculating. There's no that thought to applying physics to it or who would you want yeah. to study this film at the time? The photo reconnaissance right. laboratory at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where all this spooky crap is is stored, apparently. Also, the Navy Photo Interpretation Center, which used microscopic techniques, which is how they determined because you're seeing a lot of grain, and so when you see it, you have to. It's the same thing with the with the Patterson Gimlin film. You're seeing a copy upon a copy upon a copy. All that we're, any of us are seeing now is a dupe of the original 16 millimeter color reversal film. So there's a clearer copy somewhere out there. Uh, the original. And so you're having people looking at the original film, making an interpretation, and they're saying it's not balloons, aircraft, or birds, and that there's something anomalous about this. So that, who are you going to believe? And again, then later on, you may have something coming out of uh, Wright Patterson saying like, oh, this, it's all balloons and birds and whatnot. Chinese spy balloons. Basically. Yeah. And the weird thing is in the report, the Robertson panel report, it all seems to be in the lens of, hey, we don't need mass hysteria about this topic. Right. So right. let's downplay it. But in a lot of ways, it seems more sinister than that, because I think the CIA found ways to use it to manipulate some UFO groups, specifically NICAP, mm -hmm. which uh, there's a great book on this called uh, Wayward Sons by Jack Brewer. Uh, highly recommend it if you want to see how the CIA and former government officials got involved with that group and kind of ultimately led to its downfall. It's a, it's a great uh, book that covers that, but uh, you know, yeah. it, it just gets into, I think 1952 rattled a lot of people. Certain former government officials are getting involved with Project Galileo right now. Right. People that have been in the news that were prominent. It's just history repeating itself, possibly, I guess. Right. I if there are a couple of other cases that I think should be brought to mind, mm -hmm. the cases that make up what uh, Rupelt dubbed the Washington merry-go-round, the two weekends in which oh, yeah. UFOs were seen over D.C. and, uh, you know, fighters were scrambled to chase after them. That's the incident that spooked the government so much that was it Eisenhower that was president or Truman at the time? I can't remember. That was that. Truman. That yeah. Was Truman. So Truman yeah. was spooked and he's like, okay, I'm going to bring in the CIA to get a handle on this and figure out what was going on because Rupelt didn't know mm -hmm. the reports were kind of just like downplayed. There were a lot of really significant reports from that year. Um, yeah, that's when, and this is from your own episode. You mentioned that there were radar signatures at 7,100 miles per hour, yeah. multiple sightings all over the DC area. And they had speculated that it was going to culminate in something happening in DC. Yes. Uh, there, there was stuff near the Washington Monument, near the White House. One of the things that you had pointed out in your episode, Rob, that I thought was also really fascinating because it ties into lots of stuff that we've talked about over the years, UFOs beyond that, just like, you know, that's all bounces back to the trickster and the paranormal, but the, was that someone had pointed out, it seemed like a bunch of small kids out playing. Yes. All these little craft, like curious right. children. 
which I think is really fa- – can you apply that to the how they interact with airplanes, what you're seeing in the sky, even the Tremonton film, yeah. or what's happening at Skinwalker Ranch, it's all of that It's the small red UFO in Close Encounters. That's the most yeah. playful sportster yeah. model. It's like zipping around, having fun. Yeah. The adults, the big yeah. uh, sp- uh, spinning ice cream toys. The big spinning uh, yeah. ice cream cone UFOs are doing their business thing, and they have the other one kind of trailing behind like a dog with the zoomies or a kid, as you were saying. There's a playful aspect of this in, in their movement. It's like the Gorman dog fights, a case from 1948. Yeah. And uh, we're, it's an upcoming issue of Welcome UFO People. Hello, UFO and, People. And yeah. when you read it, the case makes it seem like it's just this playful thing. It's like, what if a, like an alien in the sky or, or something like that was using a laser pointer on a plane? That's kind right. of what it feels <laughs> right. like because mm-hmm. it's just like chasing them back and forth and stuff like that. And yeah, there is a lot of a lot of people in witness descriptions to allude to the UFO being this thing of like childlike wonder and, and the way that it engages with a lot of witnesses. That's something that comes up time and time again. So yeah, that is an interesting aspect of it. And like, it just shows up in full force in 52, you know, not just the United States, but like the people in Korea during on the war front are seeing UFOs. There's a one particular case in Korea early on in 52 that kind of, um, makes project blue book this um it gives it publicity that it doesn't want because at the beginning the idea of blue book was we're going to investigate these cases with an open mind but we're not going to share anything with the public and then somebody on the inside leaked this case that had been passed to blue book from the korean war front and it's front page news. And it was somebody who worked on the projects uh, and, you know, and, and through the chain of command that, you know, let this stuff out. So after that, it was kind of the way they described it is like they were constantly trying to play catch up on um, the cases that they were getting. And uh, that's ultimately the sad thing is, is like Blue Book doesn't make it a year before it's like objective is completely changed mm-hmm. by an outside group by the direction of the president, which is... Well, you know, you had, when we started this, Rob, you had sent us a big FOIA dump that had a lot of information. It was talking about Pelly and all this stuff. I think it was something that maybe John had gotten at the Black Vault or whatever, but like whatever that information was, when I read through and I looked for Bethurum and I looked for the other names that he was all connected to and I read to what the government response was to that, it seemed like it was not rooted in, oh, we got to cover up UFOs, da, 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 da. It seemed like all they cared about, and I could be reading it wrong, but it seemed like their high priority was that a lot of these groups were saying that the message from the UFOs was don't use nuclear weapons, don't develop your weapons to this point, don't engage in this. And it seemed to me that the government was worried about the subversive nature of that message more than the reality of or unreality of what people were saying was happening. And that was the reason, at least at that stage, that they might have gotten involved in monitoring people. It wasn't because they believed they were having alien contact and seeing UFOs. They were worried that they were getting traction in the public eye with this message of, we need to stop developing these weapons. Depends on how embedded you think they are in this. And one of the things that I'm going to point to at this time, it's 1953 that Alan Dulles gets into and becomes the head of the CIA. And that's where you get a lot of MK Ultra kind of stuff. That's where it starts to develop in 1953. So I guess that kind of depends on what you think the CIA's role in this is, like what you think they are trying to do with the, if, if well, how do I put this? If you think that they're trying to play a more kinder role than they probably are, that depends on how you take that. Oh, I don't think, I don't think that right. at all. I just think right. it, from that one FOIA dump that we have, I just mm-hmm. think at that point, they seem concerned with communism and stopping down mm-hmm. weapons development just the messaging that was coming from it, regardless of where it was coming from or the veracity of how the people said they were acquiring it. That's what it seemed oh, yeah. like to me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and I mean, like, that's Which just... Which was something the, I didn't know that until I looked at that. You know, yeah. So. And that's just a lot of anti-communist sentiment. And that's also gets into a lot of the conspiracy theories that come up 
through like the contactee age and stuff too, because a lot of contactees don't like the national reserve system and they don't like our monetary system and such. And that's like one interesting aspect of that. So like, yeah, there is that very communist element to it, but at the same time, it's so weird because there are also like, I know it's very Christian in many ways too. Like uh, I, that's one strange aspect of the, of that entire phenomenon. But yeah, like it would make a lot of sense that you want to pay attention to um, people who might be engaging in communist activities. And it's important to note that uh, Hunt Williamson, Dudley Pelly, they were very anti-communist. Truman Bathurum was anti-communist there's kind of a mixture in between uh which is yeah which his is next book was anti-communist book right after yeah, this basically. a couple years yeah. later yeah. yeah yeah well as as his co-workers told him and because they had sons now fighting in korea that you know there was a, a lot of reports of an underground communist network being uh, initiated mm-hmm. in the u.s and they told him like, wait if we see you mess around with them saucers again we're gonna plug you and those commie outer space weirdos so that was very much like they just see unrecognizable uniforms of people getting out of a ship. They're just going to mm-hmm. shoot first, ask questions later. There's a lot of paranoia ramping up at this point, being fueled conversely by the government and what was, was happening really with the people. So it's the perfect storm of that kind of sentiment. So that was a big topic then. And you start to have, I think, this general wave of paranoia, justified or, or not, however you, you want to see it. But it was prevalent and palpable, and it's influencing people's ideas of, uh, if you want to get sociological about it, the the other, the fear of the other, and uh, the alien being the other, mm-hmm. or xenomorphophobia, <laughs> making up new word. Just like people, like I, they're just afraid of everything, even though we just came out of World War II, our troubles are not over. There is more prosperity in the country, but uh, hearkening back to a classic film, Rich would know uh, the best years of our lives. Uh, is it Dana Andrews or whatever? Everybody comes back from the war. A lot of people are messed up. Yeah. yeah. The jobs they had aren't there anymore. You know, he was an officer coming back from the war. Now he's going to work at a perfume counter. Right. And so everything was tilted around, even though it was a time of rising prosperity and world domination as a as a world power. But now you have the weekend of circuses. Now you have a government who th- built themselves up to think, hey, we just we just conquered the world or we just prevented it from, you know, from the Nazis. And now we're fighting the communists. And now there's something flying around the skies we have no control over. So then you have, the, by the time that Eisenhower gets in, well, here's a guy uh, who is a strong military leader. Mm-hmm. And again, if you believe the uh, conspiratorial mythology about it, is that he met with the aliens and contracted a... Uh, or had a contract with them to, uh, right. hey, you uh, you don't eat all of us, and we'll uh, you know we'll exchange ideas and technology, and you can't eat a few of us, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's not to be comical, but is it's pretty dark. And now you have people. It was a John Ramirez or and others saying like, well, we made a contract with them, and even I think Grush uh, was saying this that we made a we made a pact with them, and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the smartest thing to do. It didn't see our you know it wasn't totally to our benefit. And it's like, what do you mean by that? It's this, it's the recycled narrative, uh, and and the thing is, is like that Eisenhower stuff goes back to Mead yeah. Lane in the fifties. Mead Lane was talking about that in the fifties, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I don't think uh, a lot of people know that uh, because Mead Lane, I think has largely lived in the periphery of the UFO age. I, I mean, he's there at the beginning. If you want, if you technically want to get down to it, um, the first technical modern contactee was mark probert who Hmm. was uh you know having contacts with aliens on crafts like psychic contacts in 1946 so like Mm -hmm. um, you know between and and he was working with mead lane in the borderlands uh, research association and such in the 1950s like yeah we won the war but we became heavily paranoid about it (laughs) That's basically what had happened to the point where, you know, we tried to create mind controlled soldiers, which didn't work. We did, you know, research into um, SRI, did their stuff in the 70s. Right, right. um, The Manchurian candidate. Yeah, the Manchurian candidate. Like, it's full of so much paranoia that seemingly came from the Soviet Union itself. Like, I don't think any of the stuff that we believe the Soviet Union was working on were actually working. <laughs> it's just disinformation that you're, you know, 
introducing yeah. into the American public. That's what it was. And Which ties in with the, the conspiracy that uh, we faked the moon landing to get them right. to bankrupt themselves trying to build spaceships and uh, and land on the moon. And it's like, well, it gets really wild and that's never ended. It didn't just start in the 50s either. That's always been there. Hi, I'm Sam Mines, studio host of the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs, and when I'm not talking baseball on the radio, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Well, as we begin to round the bend, as Scott says here on our conversation, towards uh, heading towards a enjoyable and inconclusive conclusion for all of us, I hope, there's just a few things that, again, from this lecture, I thought was really fascinating. I have to give a shout out to get because these are just the notes from Wondrium. And this guy would have been a terrific professor, Professor Richard B. Spence. He had two courses on there that, of course, immediately attracted my attention. Secrets of the Occult, and one whole episode, number 12, is just about UFOs and the occult. And the other one was Secret Societies, which I just mentioned, which he talked specifically, a whole episode, just mostly about George Hunt Williamson, because he is so prominent here in that he is connected indirectly to the Truman Bathurums and the the contactee movement. Williamson, again, young guy, 26 at the time, and he ends up calling them, labeling them the space intelligences, and he's connected with his friend Alfred Bailey and Alfred's wife, also named Betty. That's the name of George Hunt Williamson's wife. And they it's a little bit of a couple's thing that they do, which I imagine they're not playing bridge or Pictionary. They are trying to contact aliens via more metaphysical means. And so as Ouija Rob boards. mentioned, yes, yeah, <laughs> the Ouija boards, but they had a shot glass. I used that as the, the yeah. planchette. But also, again, I found these technologies interesting as well, trying to use shortwave radio, because again, you only have, well, you have a limited amount of access to high-tech stuff that you see on shows like Skinwalker Ranch now, uh, certainly no drones, but they did have some means of communication. And like I said, it's a direct conduit to them. On the other hand, you have people... Truman Bathurum doesn't get too woo-woo. He's a salty-the-earth kind of guy, just a, a manual labor, blue-collar, but not a troglodyte. He understands these concepts, but this is not stuff that he usually thought about, if you tend to believe him. But he did think that there was a telepathic connection to the saucers. Well, that's what they told him. Just think about us, and we'll come down and visit you. And at one point, he told Captain Ora Reigns, could you please translate these questions in French? And... It's an interesting technique. Again, good sci-fi concept if it's made up or it's just his imagination, but he takes the letter or she takes the letter in French and holds it up to the wall. And he hears, uh, he sees some flat, a little bit of flashing. And then he hears the, the only sound he could describe while he was there. It sounds like typing. So somebody's somehow that letter is like, a, it's a giant photocopier. Somebody back there who could, uh, a little alien guy who could speak French is, is translating that into a typed message, which is again, a technology he can understand, but also connected to he just makes a comment that I think she read my thoughts about this, like what I wanted to happen. And I got thoughts from her about the technology they were using, that somehow there were four control stations on this craft. And perhaps these are something like the gravity amplifiers described by people like Bob Lazar, is that there are four stations. There could be, it could be under robotic control or maybe something like AI, which he doesn't mention, but somehow robotic control, as he says. So these are concepts that he believes were implanted because I, he said, I don't really think about these kinds of things. I never have. And I don't know where I got these ideas. Maybe it was something psychic from Captain Rains. Anyway, going back to the occult here, the golden age of flying saucers with the four Georges. So we have George Hunt Williamson, George Adamski, George King, George Van Tassel. What connects all these guys as well as uh, their occult beliefs and practices we generally don't think, as I said at the beginning, to connect this with transmediums, magics, demons even, <laughs> except now that people are starting to, we're mostly, I'd say the mainstream connects it to advanced technology and science. But as Professor Clark says, he, again repeating Arthur Clark's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So even he's saying, like, there's a magic property to this, perhaps, or just the way in that it appears to us. There is no doubt that this phenomenon is real. And to seekers uh, like Williamson, the only way to access all of this is through occultism. 
the only way to get at an answer is not through sensor data or machines. It's through the metaphysical processes of uh, that are employed by occultism. And that's what they all have in, in common. Also, it's, again, I would say practically, it's a quick direct route. Like I always say, like you, if you, uh, you could try and build a time machine or you can astrally project yourself to the past or the future. It's a lot easier and cheaper, although it takes a lot of practice, better, easier than trying to build a time machine. And also you're not going to get maybe embedded into the ship steel of the, uh, in the Philadelphia experiment. This all underlying goes back to a little bit of Aleister Crowley as will, and what may be called the act of will, in that you are willing this procedure to happen, this following, this enlightenment, as Rich was calling it. What's, it, what's driving this? Is it just the people, or is it the, a bit of a zeitgeist thing? George Henry Williamson, like a lot of these people, had an experience early on in their lives that, that affected them, like so many of these people. Uh, like Orfeo Angelucci, I think, was sick. A lot of these people have a, an injury. Something happens to them. It changes their mind. He claims to have had an out-of-body experience and a psychic experience in college, uh, Williamson. He dabbled in spiritualism. And that's where he, he first started encountering things like the Ouija board and channeling. And he took inspiration from this book. I'm not sure if we mentioned it yet. I think Scott did. Waspy, A New Bible yeah. uh, by John B. Newborough, uh, written in the 1880s that uh, he claims was channeled by a spiritualist dentist, uh, this new bro, and he used a, a typewriter for automatic writing. So that's a little bit novel. And uh, there you go. He's there we go. Rich has got it. <laughs> Rich is holding it up. <laughs> Rich has got it. There you go. Oh, it's man. Unity, Volume 1, Cosmon. It's a Cosmon Bible. I have oh. a collection of Bibles. The, the oh, interesting. Familiar with, oh. And then others that we're not as familiar with. Right. That's O A H. S-P-E is the name of the John Newbro New Bible, and there's a whole origin story that goes along with it. But basically, this was a con conceived through channeling. Newbro claimed that uh, he was in contact with angelic ambassadors piloting starships, who he claimed came to Earth 80,000 years ago to initiate the spiritual and physical evolution of humans. And where are we hearing that now? Well, we're getting little bits of that coming to us on the internets and through a little bit what Bob Lazar said, and, and again, that, that narrative is that aliens, the greys, this particular cult, sect, race, species, whatever you want to call them, seeded human beings that have visited us multiple times throughout the years to correct us uh, on our course of idiocy and lunacy, apparently. And they're essentially our genetic overlords manufacturing us for some purpose, either their own survival or to create a new kind of species and some kind of hybrid thing. That's a whole other ball of wax. Going on, though, uh, gets getting back to Guy Ballard, his thing is basically, yeah, a rehash of Theosophical Society uh, Blavatsky Latherings. Uh, but he had more than a million followers, uh, the I Am movement, back in the 1930s. That's pretty impressive for back then. Oh, I'd like to make a recommendation. If for anybody that wants to learn about the I Am Mm -hmm. cult there is a great video that my friend emily louise did uh she has a great youtube channel called weird reads with emily louise and uh she did one that is called you know the cult of i am it's an hour yeah. and a half long if you really want to know like how intense it really got because uh guy ballard if you listen to guy ballard's mm -hmm. recordings of him he sounds like the uh, priests you hear at the pulpit on Sunday mornings on TV. Like yeah. he has that kind of fire in him. And uh, yeah, the, the, they're <laughs> Dudley Pelly, as he was associated with them, ran for president in 1936, uh, believing that he could beat FDR and such. Mm. But like one of the overall beliefs of the I am cult was they wanted to overthrow the government. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. The video in question is called uh, "The Cult of I Am: The Wild Story of Guy and Edna mm. Ballard's New Age Reli Religious Movement." It's really good. It's really well researched. This is not so. I think a lot of people tend to think of the nineteen fifties as pretty, you know, Aussie and Harriet, Leave It to Beaver, mild mannered. Mm. This got pretty wild. And mm -hmm. going back to nineteen forty six, uh, I mentioned this a little bit in part one because it's so juicy and salacious. So uh, Jack Whiteside Parsons, John Whiteside Parsons, they 
he went by Jack. He was a follower of Crowley, Alistair Crowley, and also connected to L. Ron Hubbard, uh, more sci-fi with uh, alien overtones. Parsons at that time, along with Hubbard, I believe, you could read more about that story in City of Courts, Mike Davis, a uh, fantastic book. But he goes on to, as the story goes, Parsons tried to incarnate the goddess Babylon, the scarlet woman of Revelation. And that's about the time that he met Marjorie Cameron. And as we talked about part one, some believe that Parsons may have opened a portal and flying saucers and demonic entities controlling them all flew through. This is also connected to the Collins elite, which we talked about in part one, uh, concluding uh, th these are high-ranking military officials, maybe like the Millennium Group, uh, <laughs> they, who think that demonic entities are somehow connected with this. Parson mm. dies in 1952 of June of 1952 in Mysterious Explosion. That year, the, yes. the yeah, Washington, D.C., again, 1952. Marjorie Cameron yep. interprets this as this flap is, this is somehow kind of acknowledgement of her friend Parsons' death. She then becomes friends with George Van Tassel. And it's all around the same time with Williamson, Adamski, Van Tassel. They all start to channel space intelligences. Here's a little thing that we had not mentioned before that is mentioned in the uh, Professor Spence lecture. It goes back to 1917, back to Utah here. Salt Lake City newspapers report mysterious lights, strange airships. Some local men claim that they were builders of this craft that was spotted. And this is around the time of World War I. So again, we're talking about wartime paranoia. A lot of people thought this could be a German plot, uh, the spaceship business here. Leon Bone was a, I know it sounds like a, a blues musician, uh, but he was a local <laughs> FBI agent. And he investigated the men who were willing to talk their leader was a local Freemason named John Van Valkenburg. And they tell Bone, Agent Bone, this wild story. Agent Bone probably sounds like an early World War II Fox Mulder. They talk about encountering this being out in the Nevada desert with various names. One of them, the Adept, the Adept, the Fountainhead, the Superpower, the Old Man, or the Above One. Van Valkenburg claimed that the Adept live in a giant stationary airship high above the Earth, uh, he gave him a small spinning disc. Often there's an, a gift exchange, as we've seen uh, with some of these stories, or a small device that operates the bigger device. Like, like Orfeo Angelucci had that piece of metal the size of a quarter. He puts They put on the floor. It dissolves into the floor. The spaceship then turns on. And it's a little, maybe a little bit of a, like a power tide pod of sorts that runs the ship. Apparently this mm. ship could travel at 1,000 miles per hour at any altitude, was immune to weather. It didn't use fuel. This disc negated gravity. The adept could communicate with him telepathically. There we are. But this is 1917, not the 1950s. This is 1917. We're already talking about telepathic communication with space entities. And the adept could communicate with him and it could assume the forms of friends or family, alive or dead. Okay, now we're talking about doppelgangers, vardogers. That's pretty wild. Could also be Psychopomps, you know? Psycho like, uh, exactly. Well, speaking of yeah. death, uh, the people who saw this claimed that the lights on the airship could transform into death rays. It was at once a uh, propulsion and a weapon, which is exactly what we're talking about nowadays with our reverse engineering. So then Bone uh, decided to join this group. So Fox Muller joins the wacky people. And uh, he, he, well, this is pretty fascinating. I got nothing else going on except my FBI career. And, and found that this was mixed up with Mormonism back in the day. So that's a fascinating angle I will not get too far into. But uh, getting back to Albert K. Bender in 1952, then we're talking now, he's located in Connecticut, or he's from Connecticut. And that's when the International Flying Saucer Bureau is founded, 1,500 members. And uh, he said that he was going to reveal all. But of course, that's curtailed by the men in black, men in black suits, three of them who told him that he was right about the nature of UFOs, but he couldn't say anything or else. And Bender, again, fascinated by the occult. In this lecture, somebody that we're connected to, Alan Greenfield, and the secret site for mm -hmm. the Ufonauts, he's brought up several times in this lecture, in, in both of these lectures. And so um, he, we have a connection to him on, uh, on Twitter, now X, but interesting guy, very interesting writing. So Anyway, his ideas and his apparently research that focuses and connects the UFO contactee movement with the occult kind of reinforces these ideas. Adamski also calls these men in black the silencers. 
Uh, the intruders, negative space intelligences, that's what Williamson called them. The worst MIBs, Williamson claimed, were from the dying star system in Orion, and they wanted our natural resources and souls, which seems a little invasive. But getting back to the occult and perhaps the rising of the dead, these categories often describe them as looking uh, like gaunt cadavers, reanimated corpses. Made me think, uh, throw in at least one more film reference here, Dark City. I don't know if you guys have watched that, but mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty good. But it also hints at shapeshifters getting back to Skinwalker Ranch and making that connection. Somehow, they, uh, if they can change into your family and friends in 1917, they can change into other creatures and beings or just disappear completely. And in occult lore, quote, the black man, that's not referring to race, that's referring to the darker than dark, blacker than black shadow, or like the black monk of the medieval period. So it's like an avatar of the devil almost, in a demonic incarnation that pervades now UFO lore and just this idea of like, well, what if the man in black showed up in a yellow suit <laughs> or just something from the Steve Harvey collection, something lively, fun? No, it's got to look the same. It's got to be, very, it's like what priests wear, monks. There's a cartoon I found about that like a, a little while ago. It, it was published in, I think, one of Gray Barker's mm -hmm. publications and it was, Artwork done by Gene Duplantier, who worked a lot with Gray Barker and others in the field. And mm -hmm. like, it's a comic of this man in black walking out of a, a clothing store with a new snazzy shirt, you know, basically saying, you know, it's time to change it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on. You know, let's the change with the times, at least, which they do. But if you look at black eyed kids, it's like they're at least 70 years behind. It's like they can't get it together. We can't get the machine with the little wheels of the time machine here uh, to to really land or use our chrono visor to see what the fashions are like to really blend in. No, we're going to ask you about mm -hmm. using your telegraph and we're going to dress like uh, 1920s farm kids. It doesn't line up. It, it can't somehow. They cannot make that connection, or maybe they just don't care. I think it's a little bit of both. But getting back to George Hunt Williamson, who I think is a major character here who is really just passed off as a kook, but he's really connected into this, embedded into this occult angle. His view of these space intelligencers, again, this takes a, a bit of a dark turn, aside from all the other uh, weird stuff we just mentioned. But getting back to Dorothy Martin, who has a background in theosophy, connected to the I am movement also was a channeler and that was her angle on on how to connect with these people and disseminate these pearls of wisdom so then we get into uh my notes here about uh George Hunt Williamson just a little bit about his background he as is described here was not your run of the mill nut a tin foil hat as professor spence says he is pretty mysterious himself. He was born in Chicago under the name George Leonard Williamson. During his lifetime, he would assume various identities. So he was drafted into the Army Air Corps in 1945. Uh, he was assigned to public relations. That could be important on how to deal with the media and uh, messaging to the public. It could be a coincidence or not, but Air Force PR personnel played prominent roles in debunking UFO sightings. Maybe he knew the, how the stuff worked as a career skill. After he leaves the military, he relocated to Arizona to attend the, uh, the U of A, University of Arizona, in pursuit of a graduate degree in archaeology. In the same year, he traveled to Lincoln County, New Mexico, about an hour west of Roswell to work on an archaeological dig, or so he claimed. Only two years earlier, Roswell had uh, had crashed there. So there's a connection there. He was hunting for Native American artifacts, or was he looking for something else around Roswell and Lincoln County? We don't know. He was briefly recalled back to military service in 1949, and there he received a commission as a second lieutenant. Uh, he also received a commission in the newly christened Air Force Civilian Auxiliary, the Civilian Air Patrol. And there he became a lieutenant colonel. He stopped his academic studies in 1951 when he was expelled from the university for unspecified reasons. Around this time, though, he got married to Betty, his wife, who became his enthusiastic assistant. So I think this is all to say it's like, yeah, he may have been a nut, but like he, uh, 
he's very mysterious and had a military background and a little bit of, uh, he's just an interesting dude. That's all I'll say. He could still be just uh, totally off his rocker. But again, had enough background, I think, to really insert himself into the contactee movement. And if he was doing it for some weird psychological necessity that's not entirely wholesome, he knew which levers to pull. I think he knew how to game this, this all, like a lot of these guys did, perhaps Adamski. Adamski himself, I mean, he started, um, he's first arrived in California in the 1920s. It get, tried to get into the movies, but that didn't, that didn't work out. So what do you do? You form a cult. That's also, <laughs> you're around a bunch of people who are, uh, love to hear themselves talk, actors that may not be working out. Well, what do you think Manson got his start? exactly in that same realm with with music and actors and getting people who had moved out here for some kind of thing that maybe didn't work out were looking for a movement to join something they can now believe in so in other words southern california is cult central uh, in the united it states is. Like, it's it is it's one of them pretty just, much <laughs> so many <laughs> ufo cults have uh, popped up here so many cults in general yeah. have popped up in southern california there's just something about it that screams you know cult well I, I again i think this is probably a broader psychological thing sociological thing where you you have a lot of people who move out and look it's a very tough business it's like any getting a, an acting gig a vo gig it's like winning the lottery every time you got to do that every week to make a living and it doesn't always work out and people become disillusioned so it's like well you're already here weather's nice i uh, got a cheap apartment with a couple of roommates but you want to have a feeling that there is something bigger that called you out here if it's not going to be an acting career. Manly P. Hall, I don't think that he's so much of a charlatan, but he also tried an acting career, uh, I think in the late mm. 20s, early 30s. And he's, he compiled a tremendous amount of esoteric knowledge at the age of 19 and 20. It's just, he did an amazing thing. Didn't, like, maybe he peaked then, but it wasn't really that he started a cult, but everybody was getting into metaphysics at this time. And you could just come up with a catchy name. Adamski uh, came up with the Royal Order of Tibet, also known as the Temple of Scientific Philosophy. Well, which is really, <laughs> as Professor Spence says here, kind of a thinly disguised ripoff of an older mystical school called the Theosophical Society. So again, you're right. blending Eastern Western mysticism. And what did this kind of lead to eventually? Perhaps the New Age movement. And so he would dispense with this wisdom, Adamski, for a modest fee. But Professor Spence says the real secret of his success was the religious exemption of the Royal Order of Tibet received to make and serve wine at its gatherings. So there's <laughs> a bit of a social function here with these things. Yeah, that was one of the things that they did is they started their own wine making company while they right, were right. doing that. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the more interesting. The thing is... Uh, if you're a Domsky, and if you're going to do things like a Domsky, and there's like a, a parallel I want to make mm -hmm. here, you've got to publish your story as a work of fiction a few years yeah. before you actually yes. have that. And I think what that mirrors is MJ-12 and the Richard Doty stuff, because... Back in 2007, one thing that uh, came forward, Barry Greenwood was uh, crucial in uh, uncovering this, but before the MJ-12 documents were released, Richard Doty and Bill Moore went to Bob Pratt, who was working for the National Enquirer at the time, and they wanted him to write a novel essentially about Richard Doty, mm -hmm. and all of what's in this novel is essentially what is in kind of, uh, it's part of the MJ-12 documents. This, uh, this thing was called the Pratt Tapes, um, mm -hmm. but it, 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 does, it does a pretty good job mirroring what Adamski was kind of doing in right. the late 40s and early 50s. Like Adamski is the kind of guy who just keeps taking stabs at it until something works. Well, yeah, don't that's give up. Is. There's something's going to mm -hmm. look that's the law of averages. Something's got to work. What else you got to do? And I right. think at that this time, these people were in a position to be able to do that. I mean, Bethurum, he's got to get back to work. He doesn't have another gag. You know, he's, that's it. It's road construction or it's this and going to different speaking engagements. But he didn't, I don't know how much trouble he got into. If you go back to looking at Williamson, after his sequel, Other Tongues, Other Flesh, he starts to get the notice of the FBI and Jager Hoover. 
just to reinforce what you guys said, the FBI was concerned that some of the alien visitors reported, this is going again to uh, Professor Spence's uh, speech here, is reported by these UFO enthusiasts. They're talking about universal brotherhood and nuclear disarmament. We don't like that. Okay. And then this might be some kind of insidious commie plot. We got to check this out that you're starting to get uh, some negative attention here from the feds. They started investigating Williamson. It turned up evidence that he was smuggling antiquities and maybe drugs out of Mexico. Mm. But even then, the FBI, they never they never arrested him. And uh, maybe that's related to the national security redactions that were in his file. There's some reason they did not go after him, where they could have just nailed this guy and nailed his coffin shut and not had to deal with him, his wacky stuff. There's something in his file that prevented that. So we don't know. It's, again, a little bit of mystery. Uh, here's another mystery. So Williamson and his wife, Betty, they head off to Peru. And this time, Williamson's calling himself Brother Philip. And he claims to represent an order called the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays, which is also, isn't that a nice uh, retreat restaurant kind of thing, Rich, where a lot of weddings happen in Malibu? <laughs> Into the Seventh Ray? Is that... I, yes, I, I can't get a reservation. I it, know. It well, we're not, we're not showing metaphysical face, I think as the actors would say. Show I've face. mentioned this on the show before, yes. but I have eaten there. And the one time I ate there, I saw John Delancey, who was a guy that played uh, Q on Star Trek. So very cool. Maybe it is a secret location and he just zapped himself there or something. It's, he was driving a Ferrari yeah. Daytona, by the way. Oh, is, uh, <laughs> nice. It's that Q. Money. Strikingly beautiful, yes. yeah. Ferrari. That's the first one Don Johnson had before uh, yeah. he got the cheese grater. Yeah, uh, that right. they blew up. I think. Yeah, it did. Terrific. Well, there, there you yeah. go. Anyway. Uh, it's for the metaphysical. Hugh drives uh, a Ferrari, and he eats at the end of the seventh ray in Malibu. A colliding of two different worlds: the metaphysical and the very uh, sporty physical. In any case, yes, it's pretty hippy dippy, which again is very LA to me. But what was going on here with Williamson? What are you doing in Peru with a different name? What's going on with all this? I guess there are some claims that he was running an esoteric monastery in the Andes. Hard to prove, but in a dark turn in 1958, Betty, his wife, dies of fever and malnutrition. And there was a rumor that she'd been pushed off a cliff. So who knows? War murder mystery here. Mm -hmm. Williamson, after this, starts calling himself Michel de Obrevnich. Obrevnich or Michel de Obrevnich Duwarnovich. I don't know why. Uh, this is an addition to claiming to be the Duke of Sumaja. <laughs> he also purported to be the heir to the throne of Serbia. And as the lecturer says, that's about the half of it. Williamson also joins a bogus offshoots of the Knights of Malta, headquartered, not in Malta, but Chicxini, Pennsylvania. And I'm sure I'm mangling that name, but... Uh, Seems odd. You get emails pronounced. <laughs> That's right. Chaucer. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but again, leading, this is all connected, leading back. What does that group represent? Well, it's got some aging fascists in it and retired military and intelligence officers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You cannot escape it. Uh, when you get into the more esoteric side of things, there are just Nazis everywhere. You can't, yeah. you can't escape it. it. Well, Fascism hey, is all over the place. you got the shirts. You got to do something with them. They're fancy. They're silvery. Wearing them to a Beyonce concert wouldn't happen for another 70 years. So uh, you got form a club. A lot of people just want to belong to something. That's one of my bigger points here. It's just human nature. So now we're talking about the 1970s, though, and I'll make a connection here back to Truman, and then I, I promise to stop <laughs> talking. Now moving forward to the 1970s, the golden era of hippies and cults and weirdness in Southern California, Williamson, now going by, well, Williamson or Dobrenovich, was consecrated as a bishop in the obscure American Orthodox Catholic Church, an outfit with more links to intelligence circles, again, very strangely, and getting back to now, I swore I looped this back to Bethurum a little bit, he relocates to Santa Barbara, California, and it is there he founds his own religious order called the Holy Apostolic Catholic Church, and he briefly marries a former B-movie actress. Now, to wrap up this whole uh, lecture by Professor Spence, this is what was interesting is that he was a history graduate student at UC Santa Barbara, and he got to meet the former George Hunt Williamson. 
And Professor Spence caps us off, and I thought it was worth mentioning. And yes, I just read the entire lecture, uh, but hopefully I thought it was interesting. <laughs> the person, oh, look, I took these notes. I'm going to use them, okay? This took me a long time. Probably a whole day I was procrastinating <laughs> trying to research something else. But I finally, five years later, it comes in handy because all this stuff is somehow connected. Well, Professor Spence said the person who introduced them was a retired Air Force colonel, of all things. He says, Quote, standing back and looking at the strange career of George Hunt Williamson, Spence can't help but suspect that he was a spy of some sort. The only question is, whose? It's such a weird thing. You look at other these other uh, conspiracy theories of uh, people, Lee Harvey Oswald, perhaps, of like, how is he connected to the CIA, perhaps? How is he, you know, there's just enough shadowiness that people, it raises a lot of questions. I see a lot of uh, Fred Chrisman in him. Fred Chrisman was famously, um, wow, I'm, I'm blanking. Mary Island. Yeah, the, oh, it, the yeah, Mary Island yeah. incident. So, On yes. that boat. Um, yeah. Which was then flown back, apparently aboard a B-25, which then crashed en route. And the uh, did you know that? That the pieces were supposedly transported going back to an Air Force base, yeah, Edwards, I think? in a cereal box, of all things. Yeah, it was the, they were placed in the cereal box. So uh, the interesting thing, yeah, this happened to Harold Dahl in uh, June 21st, 1947. He supposedly saw, while he was out uh, salvaging some logs in the Puget Sound, he witnessed a group of donut-shaped objects above one of them came close and dropped a bunch of slag material down. And the interesting mm. thing is, is like his Donut boss. Shape, oh, <laughs> Come on, man. He just had a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't but, have dessert. It's right. He delicious spray. <laughs> so the interesting thing is, is that Fred Crispin was his boss. And mm. uh, Crispin is interesting because he has ties to the assassination of john f kennedy he has a lot of ties in a lot of different things um uh but uh yeah he just seems like a very kind of fred chris mini guy mm -hmm. there's these two shadowy people that like are in a lot and yeah. they seem to have a lot of connections in a lot of high places and that really makes you wonder within the UFO sphere, a lot of people with a lot of connections in a lot of high places really makes you wonder where the military is involved in this phenomenon to begin with and how intensely involved they are. Absolutely. And that's what <laughs> Professor Spence was saying. It's like, look, he had no further connection with this, but he was retired to George Hunt Williamson by an Air Force colonel, which is a pretty high rank. And mm -hmm. what's going on here? Why do these guys seem to end up in the same circles? Which is... A little bit antithetical to Truman Bathurum's experience, where he's just a regular guy. He's, as he claims, or maybe he's lying about all this. He says, "Well, I never. I don't know what really she's talking about. I never. I'm talking about Captain Aura Rains. Is that she can't be pumping me for information because I don't have any. I've never worked at a secret facility. Even if this guy was like, you know, an employee of Whack and Hut at some point, it's like, oh, you opened the door for this and that. Did you peek inside? Well, maybe you got some information." He's like, look, I'm basically a concrete plant operator. I, you know, a mechanic. I understand some of this from the mechanical aspect of it, because that's what he's interested in. But I have no other knowledge of this. And he asked her, why did you pick me? She's like, well, you're kind of close to the landing area. That's it. Maybe. Right. You know, like I said, it's an everyday man's experience. Not this guy who started four cults and has got, goes by four names and uh, used to be in military PR or intelligence. It's just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's so rife with just mystery. All the other characters in this and crosses over into theosophy, metaphysics, cults, political movements, unsavory behavior, weird people, deaths. And then, and then you have basically a guy who's a mechanic with a prolonged contact experience and tale to tell. And I think because perhaps he's not involved, admired in all this other bizarre weirdness, his story is often overlooked. I certainly had never heard of him before we gifted Rich the book and that Scott found it. Yeah, it was gifted to me. Bookending this, how did, right, we had a friend that uh, gave it to you. 
you thought it'd be a good yeah, idea he to stumbled give it to across Rick. it on in a bookstore here in Greensboro in North yeah. Carolina. But Rob, you had heard of Bethurum before we contacted you about it. Truman, of course. Yeah. I knew of the um, the core kind of contactees and well Bethram isn't high up on that list. Yeah. He's definitely a player. Um, Why do you think there. he's not high on the list? I don't think he's somebody who tried to profit off his story as much as the others did. He's right. uh, yeah. Which well, is kind, kind of what of this... Forrest was saying a minute ago. Uh, in yeah. a way, it's like uh, and it, that goes hand in hand with the whole four names and starting cults in different places and all that kind of stuff. It's like, oh, I'm going to make a living off this, you know. I mean, he had his own club, but it didn't. Uh, I'm trying to remember Nobody what the name of his club, his club was, but it was it was something completely different. It was like the Secrets of Knowledge or something yeah. like that. It was a. Yeah, yeah. But Rob, what did he do with the rest of his life? Did he was he just on a lecture circuit, or did he fade back into his own life and just continue with you know doing his uh, work for Wells Cargo? Uh, I think he just went back to doing what he was doing. I mean, he made a lot of. He went to Giant Rock a lot of times. He, you know, made a lot of appearances out there. But I, the vibe that I get is that he lived a pretty normal life. He divorced in 1956. And I don't remember if he remarried. I think he might have. But um, in like 1960, something like that. I think the, the thing about Truman is that he is the everyman. He is kind yeah. of the everyman that. Yes. has a very strange experience. And I think he's on like the other side of that as to where the vibe of every other contactee that you get, if you listen to them go on and on and on about everything is they have some kind of cosmic philosophy that they want to present to the world. Mm -hmm. And Truman didn't do that. So uh, you really wonder what made a guy, if he made it up, what would make him do that? Like, was he incredibly bored out in Las Vegas <laughs> doing his job, a job that he didn't want to do? So he invents the story. I don't think it's that likely because if you're going to try to gaslight your wife into coming out and visiting you uh, and trying to make her jealous with this alien <laughs> woman, um, it, it doesn't help out your story very much. So, you kind of have Truman Bethram on one of two sides, at least the way that I look at it. He's a guy that either had genuine contact experiences or he was a guy that was duped by somebody, you know, whether that be the government or something else. Like, it's hard to say that the government did it. But then again, the government committed psyops all the time. So, like... I can't totally rule it out, but look, there's a picture of him signing our books. Yeah, yeah. I just I found uh, I found his uh, find a grave through Ancestry. It's, it's, so he's mm -hmm. born August 21st, 1898, died May 21st, 1969, at the age of 70, buried at 29 Palms. It says where he yeah. is and everything. Yeah, but there is a. It's actually a pretty cool picture of him signing a book. He looks kind of cool. Got his shades on and got like a almost like a. Yeah, yeah. A, like a Carradine vibe going on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, John, like, John Carradine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, John Carradine, yeah. exactly. But yeah, he's tied up in it all. Like, he's definitely yeah. tied up in it all. He just doesn't profit it off of it like everybody else did. I mean, his follow-up book is not about his trip to Clarion. It's right, not about right. that. And I think that kind of like humbleness is what makes his story appealing. Yeah. But yet again, it, it really makes you wonder what was truly behind it, because I think he totally did experience something. I just don't yes. know if it was something not of this world or whatever, or whether he was being manipulated by human elements, human factor. I don't know that. Because I think are some you, people are you have to been. Find his grave? What are you? I'm following the search that Scott. Are you? Go uh, I was looking at out? his last where he lived. He lived in Yucca Valley. I was curious yeah. uh, if it had. Oh. Sometimes I like to see if you can get to the house or something. That Scott they, likes to stalk people. In. You know, like, uh, I thought you were going to go. Well, I mean, he's dead. Body. I'm not stalking him on this plane. You're dead people. I just you're just stalking him on this plane. You're stalking the 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 CEO of Wells Cargo is all uh, for a story uh, yeah, that he yeah, might yeah, have. Yeah, I did yeah. leave him a message That's today. Next. What, what I'm trying to say is, let's go dig up his body. 
<laughs> well, uh, Rich, oh, to that God. point, it's already hey, gone. Cool. I guarantee you it's like Ben Kenobi. It's just going to be his clothes and no bones or anything. 29 he Palms, sees- Desert Center, where Adamski stepped. We can go there, Rich. I say a road trip. It's starting to cool down now <laughs> on the desert. It's only about 100 <laughs> degrees on the daytime. Look, everyone knows I got nothing to do. I know. <laughs> and, well, you, and you can take notes for a future writing project, and it'll be Ooh, worthwhile. Pencils that down, you can- Forrest. Pencils down. Oh, really? I thought you could at least work on your own ideas, right? I can't use a pencil. Right. <laughs> a word processor. I can, maybe I can dictate notes into my phone. I think that's, I'll call the guild. I think it's okay. I need to know the rules now. I just, I need to know the rules because like, you know, there's rules to this phenomenon. There's right. rules to how yes. you can, you know, dictate that's your information. Right, it's wild, man. There's a lot of rules. rules. Yeah. yeah. Some people don't know. There is a genuineness as I got with Orfeo Angelucci, and in that case, also Southern California, but we did retrace some of his steps. And there is something, there's nothing there now. There's no or- Orthon footprints with little uh, symbols. But there is something about being in the place in that time. And with the genuineness of these people, because I think with or Angelucci as well, is that, you know, these people didn't, they got nothing good out of this. You know, you get to sign some books, but, you know, it, it wasn't good on their marriages, certainly. You've now got this reputation. You're getting ribbed at work. Although at, at, at Orfeo's work, I will say at one time he did look out the hangar door and there were some orbs that I believe that he described other co-workers did see. Yeah. And he listed their names in the book. He listed yes. like a dozen names that I assume, you know, you could go check out. And so there is a there is an honesty there. Whether you believe it or not, there is something that is heartfelt and genuine. And I and I can feel not pity for these guys because how many of us here listening to this wishes something that monumental would uh, would appear to us? Maybe not write a book or go announce it or tell your coworker. You know what happens to, to people who, who do that? They start podcasts and you don't want <laughs> to do that. We don't need you any don't more of those. To do that. All it takes yeah. is one flying egg outside of, you know, in the parking lot at your work. And then there you go. And now you got to deal with me for two hours. That's, I don't know. <laughs> but but That's Rob, true, we though. love you. It's, it's, yeah. Back then, there'd be the, the, you know, the true man cast. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! A Dempsey cast. Yeah, oh, I, God. we just talked yeah. about this. What they didn't have back then, you could do with a newsletter, with a club, with a group, pressing LPs that you sell on the mail out of the back of you know comic books. There is different ways to get your message out, and I think when you look at it, and you, people say, "Well, I just made up all that to, to sell a bunch of books." Well, there's no history of people getting really rich off this stuff. Unless you start a cult, or as Creed Bratton said, that was that's now a meme. It's like <laughs> I've been uh, I've been in a lot of cults. I've started a few. You make more money as a leader, but you have more fun as a member. So <laughs> people do this for different reasons, but these guys did not do that. Especially Truman, he's not he's not putting on a robe and <laughs> grounding himself something. He just had a very odd story that I think he realized even the reception he got during this, it was not good. <laughs> and he did it anyway. He's like, I got to, I know, but this is my lot in life. I got to tell people the story. He just thought it was too important. And it didn't keep on happening. It just stopped. And that's it. Until you're in the afterlife, who knows? <laughs> That's going to wrap up our series on Truman Bathurum's story aboard a flying saucer. We'll be releasing some of the older Patreon-exclusive junk drawers into the main feed during the first two weeks of October, and we'll be back on the 14th with Halloween listener stories. Do not forget to send them in. Our next new junk drawer, our next new junk drawer episode is already scheduled on Patreon for Monday, September 25th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Hi, I'm I'm Jesse Hall. Galaxy-wide, perpetuity. My voice. V as in Victor. However they see fit. Or future compensation. Present or future. Galaxy-wide. Looking forward to hearing myself on compensation. I just really like the show. 
Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Carestia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at deadstreetproductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. (laughs) 